Episode 301 The Lewis Family Will Be Nothing Without Me Stefan's magnificent and powerful words reverberated through the huge main hall. Even Gracia was too shocked to respond. The old man actually used the inheritance to the Lewis family to threaten his grandson. Despite her shock, she was actually gloating inside still. Now more than ever, she knew that she could lean on his blindsided love for her to get what she wanted. Stefan's eyes narrowed the instant he heard this threat. Oh yes, how could he overlook this matter? When Peter Lewis first announced this marriage arrangement, he also announced his intention to make him the next heir. He could have forgotten that he had gotten the inheritance not because of his outstanding performance, but because of this engagement with his grandfather's pet instead. The reason he had agreed to this engagement with Gracia in the first place was that his grandfather had openly promised to bequeath him the Lewis inheritance. This was an attractive offer, indubitably. The intricacies of the extended Lewis family were too abundant, and the existing conflicts of interests were too copious. It would not be exaggerating to compare the Lewis family to the imperial court in ancient times. Setting aside the distant relations, and those children born out of wedlock under Peter Lewis, the old man himself already had three wives. These three women were fertile, and bore him five sons and three daughters. Of these five sons, he was most impressed with the child of his third wife, Penelope Lewis. This son was the most savvy, capable, and charismatic of them all. Unfortunately, no matter how exceptional this son was, the old man did not think that he was suitable to be the next heir, as he was born to his third wife. According to tradition, all elite families had the first sons to inherit the family fortune. Thus, he did not think Penelope's status would be appropriate to take after him. As Richard Lewis was born to his first wife, he was acknowledged inwardly by Peter Lewis as his next in line, despite not matching up to his half-brother. However, before the time came for Richard to take over the household, he passed away at a young age. Since then, the matter of succession was put aside. The old man was holding on to his power all this time. As he grew older, internal strife started a rift within the household. In the case of the elite families, it was not uncommon to see brothers turn into bitter enemies for the sake of succession. Hence, the old man was eager to get the next heir in place to create order within the family and reduce any unnecessary conflict. He was looking at the next suitable candidate. Stefan turned out to be the most satisfactory. The young chap at the tender age of 14 already garnered his approval. In fact, the old man believed that this grandson's ability was truly remarkable among the younger offspring. The young Stefan was also eager to secure his position in the Lewis family with this inheritance. After his father's passing when he was 14, he and his mother were left to fend for themselves in this big household. They would be defenseless and bullied without any power. If it were not for his maternal family being equally influential, he would probably be sacrificed in this struggle for power. Because of the mounting pressure from all sides, Stefan consented to the marriage arrangement and became the next heir. He started working in the Lewis group at the age of 18, and when he turned 20, he took over the reins. The moment he became the chairman nine years ago, he made sure to stabilize his power and status. The powerful Make Wealth Financial Group was in his absolute control. Without him, the powerful and far-reaching Lewis organization would collapse overnight. Make Wealth would be unable to sustain his loss. And yet, right now, Grandpa is using this inheritance to threaten me? This is ludicrous. Does Grandpa truly believe that I still care about the Lewis inheritance with my current status and accomplishment? He was no longer the Stefan from 15 years ago. He turned around, and his icy gaze fell on Peter Lewis. Just when the old man thought that his threat had worked, 
and his grandson would concede to his will. The latter spouted haughtily without any expression. You can give the Lewis inheritance to whomever you like. His grandfather clearly did not expect to hear this. With eyes darkening in an instant, the old man demanded, What did you say? My words are very clear. He smiled a little and continued somewhat mockingly. Grandpa, you have indeed aged. Your ears are failing you. Unfilial! You are really rebelling now! The old man was so provoked, he had to hold on to his aching chest. His face had turned red with rage by now. Are you really going to give up your inheritance for the sake of a lowly woman? Do you plan to forsake everything for her and have nothing in the end? The man sniggered and ignored his ridiculous claim. The Lewis group will truly be reduced to nothing if I leave. The old man squinted his befuddled eyes dangerously. This chap is so insolent. Regarding his grandson through squinted eyes, he thought of his temperament. He knew the young man's character well. Stefan, who had always been haughty and headstrong, had never bowed to any threats. However, to the old man, this chap was still too green and too ambitious to know what was good for him. Does this grandson of mine really believe that the Lewis group will collapse with him gone at its helm? The old man did not think so. Still, he was taken aback by his grandson's audacious remark. This fella's charisma had already overtaken mine at such a young age. By the time he realized it, the chap had already become a prominent figure. The thought was daunting indeed. Although he did not believe Stefan's words during this argument, he still wisely proceeded with care in order to determine just how much power this chap held in his hands. The old man's face sank. He was not serious about removing his grandson from his inheritance. His threat was just a scare tactic. Unfortunately, it had backfired on him. He lost his ground with the young man's arrogance. Stefan suddenly retorted with a serious look. One more thing, Grandpa. She's not a lowly woman. She's the woman that I, Stefan, have set my eyes on. Please get this right. After a pause, his gaze, cold and mocking, fell onto Gracia, who was standing at the side with a complicated look on her face. And he continued coolly, Comparing her to the one standing here, Grandpa, don't you think it's even more absurd to make me marry this dubious woman? What dubiousness? The old man glared at him agitatedly. How can Gracia be dubious? Episode 302 The Child is Not of My Flesh and Blood Isn't it so? Grandpa, are you certain that she's the woman you seek? His face had darkened by now. Inspecting her pale face, he taunted further. Properly look yourself. Between her and that woman you cherish, then, where is the resemblance? Gracia looked at the apathy on the man's face, and her heart quickly plummeted. Reading people's emotions was her forte. Just a glance, and she knew that this man had lost his patience with her. When those words entered the old man's ears, his eyes shifted from his grandson onto her. The explicit suspicion in his eyes greatly shocked her. She took a step back subconsciously, crumpled her dress in her hand, and breathed feebly and helplessly. <sighs> Grandpa! Her innocuous, doe eyes pulled him back to reality, and he vehemently denied. Impossible! She's definitely Elizabeth's daughter! The maternity test results were conclusive of her blood ties with Elizabeth. What of the features not being identical? That was not enough proof of falsehood. The young man sneered and moved to speak further, when Gracia beat him to it with her sweet call. Grandpa! Her lips were pursed, with face filled with desolation. She helplessly drew near the old man and reached out for his hand. Since he wants to dissolve our engagement, just let it be. I have no place in his heart, and that is fine with me. I only want to stay by Grandpa's side forever anyway. Which is why, Grandpa... You mustn't chase me away. Otherwise, I will miss you terribly. My sole desire is to serve Grandpa. It's just... 
The words hung in the air in suspense. Coupled with it, sorrowful tears fell from her lids and soaked her lashes. Her hands slowly shifted to her flat stomach as her lips trembled with unspeakable loneliness. The old man registered all these in his sight and believed her to be heartbroken from his grandson's declaration of his intention to terminate their betrothal. While there was guilt in his heart, there was also extreme heartache. His withered hand covered hers, and two glistening pearls of salty tears timely dripped on it. What's wrong? He panicked. Grandpa, what should I do? What about the child in my stomach? She bit her lower lip. With great determination, she put on a mask of a crumbling face and wailed, What should I and my child do? The old man was immensely startled, his face showing puzzlement. He was unaware of the child she was speaking of. Stefan's eyes narrowed, too, and they moved to track her every action, only for them to fall on her flat stomach. For a moment, he did not know what she was scheming of. She was in pain. With her tear-stained face and clawed throat, her voice trembled in sadness. Grandpa, I just learned of it. I couldn't believe it at first, but after a few verifications, this good news arrived today. I intended to break the news today, but... She raised her wet face to look at the man. Her eyes were filled with disappointment and despair. Ah, Stefan doesn't want me anymore. And that's fine. But this child in my stomach, doesn't he want it? With a bang, the old man's mind exploded in white light. She was pregnant. Could it be that she was pregnant with his grandson's progeny? Hearing those words, Stefan's eyes widened slightly, and then his face froze. She is pregnant? Could it be that she was pregnant with his grandson's child? The old man quickly grasped her wrist, a horrified look falling onto his grandson. This lass was congenitally infertile, no? How was it possible for her to have his child now? Stefan, who had heard these words, was violently startled. His eyes widened slightly as his face turned cold. This woman, just exactly what trick was she up to? Pregnant? Stefan did not remember touching her at all. Hence, he said with disgust, Gracia, don't be pretentious. I'm not! She tightly grasped the old man's hand and nervously yet fearfully explained, Grandpa, I only learned of this today, too. I originally intended to tell this good news to all of you, but uh, Stefan told me that he wants to break off our engagement. This piece of good news has since turned into bad news. I am really pregnant, though. Stefan finally realized the extent of this woman's shameless. He suddenly thought of that moment he was claiming the little woman last night, and just when it was intense, she abruptly broke down in tears and questioned him. If I belong to you, then what about Gracia? Does she belong to you too? Do you belong to her? Perhaps. While he was abroad, the shameless woman had flaunted in front of his woman that she had his flesh and blood in an attempt to humiliate her? Obviously, his woman believed it. Was that why she mercilessly blacklisted his number, treated him indifferently, and ignored him? She was so angry she would not let him touch her. It was to the extent that she found him dirty, and it was all because she believed this deceitful woman's claim. He instantly figured out the whole matter, but his heart was slightly annoyed. That stupid woman believed rumors so easily, yet had so little faith in him. She definitely needs a punishment. Still, he did not expect this Gracia to jump into the fire pit herself. It could be said that this was merely a stalling tactic. If so, then she was more scheming than his previous assumption. It was really tough to speculate how far she could go. He had never once touched her. Nonetheless, right now, she was audaciously proclaiming that she had his child. Was she not afraid that once the child was born, he would do a paternity test? Perhaps she was. His eyes widened slightly, and then turned frigid in an instant. Was it that she never planned to let the child live at all? 
Here, Peter Lewis noticed her fragility and helplessness. The heartache he felt was akin to him losing an immense amount of lifeblood for it to be fatal. The old man promptly moved to comfort her. Gracia, don't worry. Grandpa believes you. Come and sit down quickly. He coaxed her into sitting on the sofa before he proceeded to sit himself next to her. After the astonishment passed, his face brightened. Gracia, what nonsense are you spouting? Being pregnant is a good thing. It is a blessing. Don't you worry. He lightly patted her back and then turned to face his grandson, yelling, What absurdity are you spouting? Gracia is pregnant with your child. Isn't that a fortunate thing? What do you mean by pretentious? Speak properly, won't you? You don't even know how to be a responsible man. Truly ridiculous. Stefan frowned and coldly spat. Grandpa, I have never touched her. Even if she is pregnant, the baby is unlikely to be mine. She felt a chill run down her spine upon hearing those words. Feigning sadness, she quickly covered her face and convulsed heartbrokenly. <laughs> Grandpa, forget it, forget it. Since he refuses to acknowledge this child, let's just have it be gone. Episode 303, Amniotic Fluid Puncture Outrageous! It wasn't easy for you to conceive this child. This is a blessing. How can we even consider rating of it? Peter Lewis was livid and blamed his grandson fully. This ungrateful chap! Are you really intending to turn your back on your flesh and blood? Gracia help you out with all her heart, and it's all for your own good too. But what about you? You actually dare not to acknowledge your child. She's pregnant. If the child isn't yours, then whose? She consistently maintained her virtuous image before his grandfather. Naturally, the old man believed her words sans a sliver of doubt. Instead, he thought his grandson to be an insensible chap with his inability to account for his own child. <laughs> Stefan is truly the baby's father. Why won't he acknowledge it? She looked at her grandpa with eyes full of abject tears, her voice, as well as her body, quivering. To have a full view of this, Peter Lewis felt a stab of pain in his heart. He astutely held her in his arms and gently consoled. Don't cry, child. You've been wronged. Fear nothing, for Grandpa is here. I will make decisions for you. Concentrate on your health and halt your worrying. Grandpa! <laughs> Weeping with an aggrieved face, she burrowed deeper into his embrace. Her bitter cries tore into his heart more deeply and made him feel immense pain. Stefan cocked a braai and rye and stiffly lifted his lips in disdain. This woman, what superb acting. The top artistes in the entertainment industry could really not hold a candle even to half her acting skills. If it was not for his disposition, he might also believe her innocent-looking face. And now he wondered to whom child in her stomach belonged. Regarding this, he had no intention of making another comment. In the situation where his grandfather only believed her words, no amount of explanation from him would sufficiently convince the old man of the truth. At this moment, his grandfather was covering her hands with his as he went to great lengths to comfort her. Gracia, don't be disheartened. If he refuses to admit the baby, Grandpa will do it in his stead. Fret no more and dry your tears. Just focus on the baby and you. Being driven into a dead end, Gracia came up with this bluff tactic to buy time. Her hand was truly forced here. To protect her identity from total exposure, she had to take risks now. She was made aware of Stefan's knowledge about her identity, but just when did he find out? In any case, she could not worry about it now. Her identity was soon to be exposed before her eyes, and at the end of her wits, she divulged of her pregnancy. Since the man knew of her identity, she could only discredit him before the old man by declaring that she carried his child. The old man would predictably be overjoyed 
and believed her claim to be the truth. Therefore, he would bring forth much earlier the wedding between Stefan and her. Once the wedding was in place, she would really be the legitimate young mistress of this household, and the rest of those loose knots could easily be untangled subsequently. She did not fear the man's denial at all. Between his grandson and her, Peter Lewis would definitely take her side. Although a paternity test was required, her conscience would remain free of fear and guilt. She did a calculation of the time of her conception, and of her and Mark's carnal trysts, which had only started five weeks ago. Since she was safe in that period, it was unlikely for her to conceive then. Therefore, putting two and two together, she should only be pregnant for three and a half weeks. If the man wanted to expose her, he must at least present evidence to Peter Lewis. Paternity testing was not something that could be done when he wished. Even if he insisted, the old man would surely disagree. This was because amniotic fluid puncture could only be performed under the right condition. There would be a danger of miscarriage if it was performed too early into the pregnancy. It was usually performed after the first trimester. As the continuation of this family's bloodline was very important to the old man, he would naturally disagree to this test. With him around, she would be safe for the next two months at least. This meant that she would have a window of two months to strategize. Two months later, she would have her way to have a natural miscarriage. As long as she moved swifter than Stefan, he would have no way to prove that the child was not his. If everything went according to plan, all her worries would be resolved. The man standing at the highest step of this flight of stairs cast his eyes on the fiasco below, before he made his stand coldly. The thing in the womb is no child of mine. Why don't we do a paternity test to unveil the truth? She looked up and replied indignantly, All right, I'll do it. If a paternity test is what you want, I'll follow your wishes. This will prove my innocence, too. She looked squarely in his eyes without any shame and fear. To a certain degree, she was challenging him. He was holding a penetrating look when Peter Lewis cut in sternly. No way! His third wife had done the same test before, hence he knew very well the danger that the fetus might face with this procedure. It could easily cause a miscarriage. He got up with a start and severely reprimanded, this is ridiculous! How will the fetus survive if this test is carried out now? Are you crazy? Grandpa, I'll be fine! Since he wants to confirm if the child belongs to him, then I'll do the procedure! Anyway, I'm innocent! She insisted. The elderly man said wistfully, Stupid Gracia, you don't understand. This is your first pregnancy, so you don't know the procedure. You won't be able to keep the child if you do the testing now. Looking like the wronged party, she muttered with pretentious grievance. Let there be a miscarriage, then. He doesn't want to acknowledge this child anyway. If the child finds out of the father denying its existence, the child will be heartbroken. Ignore him. Regardless, Grandpa won't let you go through such a dangerous procedure. You just look after the baby in your womb, and don't worry about the rest. The old man immediately consoled her. She wiped away the tears from the corner of her eyes. Keeping her head bowed, she revealed an eerie smile at Peter Lewis's blind spot. Her creepy smile could not escape past Stefan's eyes, though. An idea seemed to strike the man suddenly as he furrowed his brows and arched his thin lips into a sardonic smile. He seemed to figure out who the father of the child was, he had to give credit to this woman who had this all planned out. She must be trying to buy time. After three months, she would quietly stage a natural miscarriage, you no? Know? She was too naive if she really thought that that would work. He was already prepared for such a scenario. Six years ago, after they got engaged, his grandfather hurried them to get married. The old man did not want to procrastinate the wedding, as he wanted to have grandchildren soon. However... This woman was just a stepping stone for him to get the Lewis family's inheritance.
Episode 304 IQ Not on Par Gracia was just a stepping stone for him to get the Lewis family's inheritance. He could be engaged to her, and cared not if they got married, but for him to touch this woman? Impossible. Hence, he made up the story about her being infertile. Everyone believed that claim in the end. When his grandfather learned of her infertility, he was somewhat hesitant. After all, he cared deeply about the matter of progeny. The wedding was repeatedly postponed thereafter. She also took the news for real, and wholly believed herself to be infertile. She did not know that she was just a pawn in his game all this time. Moreover, he had evidence of her infidelity in his hands. There were voice clips and camera footage that could prove just how innocent she was. This woman is too naive. It was ludicrous to play such a dirty trick on him. Is she really this naive to think that I can't produce other evidence of her infidelity besides doing the amniocentesis procedure? Stefan smiled and asked, Grandpa, if one day you learn that the child in her tummy isn't mine, what will you do? The old man looked at him with a start and quickly shifted his gaze onto her. The latter quickly shook her head innocently and whimpered piteously, Grandpa, you must believe me. If it's possible, I'll do the procedure right away. He can refuse to acknowledge the child, but he can't slight my reputation this way. The old man quickly coaxed. Gracia, Grandpa believes you. Once the fetus reaches five months, we'll do the paternity test. You can reclaim your innocence then. All right, I'll produce the evidence to prove your innocence. The man remained composed as he turned to walk up the stairs without any expression. Stefan's hostile eyes and chilly tone made the woman shudder all over. This man seemed to be more terrifying than she reckoned. What else did he have up his sleeve that she was unaware of? Her heart panicked with the thought of any evidence in his arsenal that he might use against her. She was always careful not to leave any trace behind her. Therefore, there should not be any piece of proof left to discredit her now. No, he would not have caught wind of her fishy dealings. The fleeting scorn and ridicule in his eyes told her otherwise, however. The thought that he might have something on her stirred her agitation further. Somehow, she had this nagging feeling that the man knew of her shading undertakings. If that were not the case, he would not be so calm and composed. In fact, when she announced her pregnancy, he did not look surprised at all. He seemed to expect this eventuality. Unless he knew that she could get pregnant? This possibility sent a chill down her spine. When she was diagnosed as infertile six years ago, she had many misgivings and feelings of ambiguity. The whole matter reeked of strangeness to her. She did not believe fully then that she had no ability to conceive. Unless... Did the man orchestrate this whole thing from behind the scenes? She was overwhelmed with terror at the thought of this, and all of a sudden, her back was soaked in sweat. The old man touched her hand and found her fingertips to be cold and clammy. Looking up, he saw her breaking out in a cold sweat, and her eyes could not hide the immense fear she felt. Gracia, don't be afraid. With Grandpa around, he won't be able to do anything to you. She held his hand with the intention to ingratiate herself to him. Grandpa, I am scared. I'm really scared. You must believe me. If this child in my womb isn't his, then who else can it be? He accused me of an affair with another man, but how could I possibly? Grandpa, please believe Gracia. I won't do anything to betray him, you, and the Lewis family. He nodded solemnly clearly convinced by her argument. I do believe you. How can my Gracia be capable of such a vileness? Grandpa believes you fully. He really wants to do a paternity test with me, though. Grandpa, it's not that I don't want to. It's just... I can't bear to lose this child because of that procedure. After all, I'm unsure if I can conceive again in this life. Her moving words effused sadness and agitation, and they struck a heartbreaking chord in him. 
Looking at her pitiful appearance, he reassured, Good girl, you need not worry. As long as Grandpa is around, nobody can bully you. I won't let anyone harm a descendant of the Lewis family. Don't feel down. Even if he refuses to accept the child, Grandpa will definitely welcome it with open arms. While her heart was bursting with joy, her face was still a mask of grievous gratification. She pounced on him and cried, Yes, Grandpa dotes on Gracia the most. Nestling in his embrace, she continuously sobbed in sorrow. Hidden from his face, an incredibly flustered and frightened look contorted her face. Alphabet Kindergarten At the school gate, a teacher helped the children board the school bus one by one. Andres, who was standing at the school entrance, sent Frederick a text message. As he raised his head, just like how stars clustered around the moon, a group of cute lolitas flocked around him. He was so used to this, though. His small face was slightly serious, his silky black hair was drooping around his ears, and his pretty orbs were glistening. A little girl with stunning eyes reached out and tugged on his shirt's edge in an attempt to converse with him. A few words would do, too. He gently turned around, a little repulsed by her touch. The girl did not mind this even one bit. Smiling with great satisfaction, she gazed at him fixatedly. Andres, where are your parents? Do you go home alone? He stoically averted his face from her and proceeded to ignore her. Alas, the guileless girl mistook his action for grief. A look of pity flashed across her face, and she tugged on his sleeve even more resolutely. Andres, I can accompany you. He expressionlessly took out his phone to check the time. How slow. This Mr. Frederick. Did his car break down on the way here? The girl continued chattering at his side. He could not help feeling a dull pain in his head from it. Unable to bear it any longer, he pivoted to face her and barked. Don't stand next to me. It's really annoying. He had already been tortured by them for an entire day. At least, spare him the headache after school. A group of imps that could only count with their fingers. How should he interact with them when their IQ was not up to par with his? Andres was the dream boy in his kindergarten. Not just the female pupils. Even the teachers from the other sections often rushed to the hallway outside his classroom to look at him through the glass windows and fangirl about him. Gosh, he's so cute! If I had such a cute child, I'd be beyond happy. His mother probably saved the universe in her past life for her to have such a cute child in this life. I'm so green with envy. Episode 305, That Child Is Not His Daddy's. Tss, how irritating. Andres felt as if he were a rare animal being watched at zoo all day long. It was really annoying. What nonsensical saying was that about his mommy saving the universe in her past life? His mommy was the one who doted on him the most in this world. His mommy might not be Superman, who had saved the world in her past life, but she was the mommy he loved with all his heart. Just when the poor kid was tangled in this bevy of smitten girls, a hero finally appeared in all splendor to save him. A Bugatti Veyron parked outside the school gate, and Frederick hopped out of it. The glistening sports car instantly attracted a burst of exclamations from the passerby. Oh, heavens! It's Bugatti Veyron! This limited edition supercar costs a fortune! I've seen it in a magazine before. This car is worth at least 10 million. Gosh, this is my first time seeing the car in real life. The flashy luxury car attracted nearby onlookers. Many took out their phones to stream a video of it to their friends. Some usually only saw such supercars in magazines, but none had seen a limited edition which was airlifted from the United Kingdom. Andre smirked. He was speechless at the passerby boldly standing beside the car and posing for a selfie. 
His agent found him in the crowd at a glance and walked briskly toward him. Andres, I came late. <laughs> the boy was in a sour mood and shot his agent a withering look, but the latter seemed to be used to this already and knew just what to say next to appease him. Astutely and sincerely bowing to him, he begged, Please don't deduct my salary. Andres, it is tough to save money for my marriage. The agent blinked his eyes and threw him a fawning smile. The boy coldly spat, Enough. Give me a reason for your tardiness, or else I'll deduct your bonus too. There is. I have a legit reason for being late. The agent immediately defended himself. Speak. I was investigating a matter today. Let me put you in the car first, and then I'll slowly present my report to you. His man leaned over and carried him into the car. The passenger seat was specifically fitted with a child safety seat for this boy. He was averse toward it, though. Such a childish item. I'm also not a kid. I don't want to sit in it. His agent felt wronged. Andres, you have no choice but to sit in it, as that's made for the sake of your safety. Plus, national law stipulates that children under the age of eight must be fastened into a safety seat. Resentment showed on the boy's face. Indeed, he was under the age of eight. In the car, the agent passed over a stack of documents to him. He roughly flipped through the files and frowned. You dispatched people to track Gracia? Yes, on a 24-hour watch. Not bad. He gave him a rare compliment and smiled. Pay raise for this month. The agent was overjoyed. Hooray to Director Andres! He was still skimming through the sheets when his eyes fell on a pregnancy diagnosis report. He carefully scanned through its content and then displayed astonishment on his face. This woman is... pregnant? Yes. How can that be? Suspicion rose in his mind and he hurriedly asked, Isn't she congenitally infertile? I'm not sure about that. His agent paused for a bit to organize the details about this on his head. In order to pull off the deceit, she specifically chose an unknown private hospital, heavily bribed the obstetrician, and did a pregnancy test. The result of the test showed that she was more or less four weeks in her gestation. Pregnant? Andres' intense gaze on the report in his hand was so sharp, it seemed capable of piercing through it. How could this woman be pregnant? She was congenitally infertile. Yet now there was a pregnancy diagnosis report? Was this a joke? He skeptically read the report several times, just to ensure that he was not seeing things. Is this news reliable? Yes. That woman is really pregnant. Frederick patiently attested to the validity of the report. Whose child was that in the woman's womb? Was it Stefan's? Damn it! He crumpled the report in his hand, and sparks of anger shot from his beautiful eyes. He clearly had an agreement with him. Since he wanted to woo his mommy and be his daddy, getting rid of the women around him was a given. This was his, as well as his mommy's bottom line and principle that should not be crossed. What did he say to him from the start? He said he would take care of it. What was the outcome then? A pregnancy diagnosis report? His expression went cold and tight, and his pink lips pursed into a grim line while his face contorted with disappointment. I told him to get rid of the women around him. If mommy finds out about this, she'll surely be heartbroken. He bent his head and looked at the crumpled report in his hand. He had a sudden insight. With a frown, he asked, Say, do you think she chose a private hospital for her pregnancy test to cover up something? Yes, I agree. Frederick nodded. The Lewis Group controls over 90% of the healthcare institutions in the capital, so all medical files in each are sent to the main database. This private hospital is on the city outskirts, and its healthcare system is not linked to the main database. Plus, when she went out that day, she's dressed in a low-key attire, yet still kept her sunglasses and mask on. Upon hearing his agent's observation, the boy's fingertips drummed on his knees. He seemed to be caught up in analysis. He drew a conclusion after a while. From your deduction, I suspect that the child in her stomach 
isn't my daddy's. Mid-speech, he stopped. The little boy was immensely shocked. He had subconsciously called that man his daddy. He hastily cleared his throat and restored his expression to normalcy before he made amend. I suspect that that child isn't Stefan's at all. The agent was bewildered and a little puzzled. What do you mean? If her child is Stefan's, this should be a reason for celebration to her. The Lewis family is big in this capital and puts heavy emphasis on progeny. If she's pregnant with Stefan's child, it will guarantee safety and riches to the mother-child pair. With a son or a daughter at her side, her position will be strengthened immensely. After a pause, he narrowed his eyes. In contrast, in the case that she is up to no good and is covering up something, her first move should be to choose a trifling private hospital, bribe its obstetrician, and do the test in complete secret. It seems that her pregnancy is something to be ashamed of. Don't you think that's strange? After his detailed analysis, the agent found it fishy too. What Andres means to say is that this child of that woman isn't Mr. Lewis's flesh and blood? The little boy sneered. This pregnancy can guarantee her safety and riches in the Lewis family. Pray, tell why she's behaving so furtively. If this isn't fishy, then what is? Episode 306 An Expression of Jealousy Andres also managed to extract something from this. That was of Stefan not having touched Gracia even once at all. His heart was relieved. Should that man really want to get him a half-sibling, he would never acknowledge that child. Frederick could not help his brows from rising in awe of the boy's wits. Andres, if you didn't explain it, I would really think that your daddy has impregnated someone else. Andres eyed him contemptuously and mercilessly lambasted. Frederick, are you comparing mine to your low-level IQ? The agent was full of grievances over Andres' belittling of his intelligence. Was there a need for the boy's brutal honesty? Saying that his IQ was low-level. Grief and indignation showed on his face. His heart was bitter, but he kept quiet about it. The boy might withdraw his bonus if he revealed his thoughts. The agent pursed his lips in slight puzzlement still. If the child isn't Stefan's, then whose is it? Definitely not yours. The boy coldly snapped. His agent uttered, I know that it's not mine. You've got an interesting question there. The little boy looked at him drawly. In what way should I know whose child is it? Do you think I'm God? The agent gleefully clapped inwardly. This child was not God, after all. He did not know everything. It was his heart's turn to feel relieved this time around. Andres, your mommy is filming a show. Don't you want to drop by? The agent asked. Nope. She's working on night scenes these few days. It must be very tiring for her. After the filming for those is over, I will definitely nourish her health. The boy then started searching through his mind for nourishment recipes. When his mother returned, he intended to feed her healthy food. The agent sitting at the side felt extremely envious. Gee, why don't I have such a filial son? That was the cold and bitter truth. In fact, he did not have a wife too. Once he had a child, he would use this boy as a benchmark in his inculcation of the child on filial piety from childhood to adulthood. He would groom his child to be smart and filial, just like this boy. Boss, based on multi-angle analysis, Miss Monica is displaying jealousy toward you. Inside the CEO's office in Makewell Financial Group, Harry, Stefan's chauffeur, raised his head from a thick pile of psychology books on his table, pushed up his glasses rim, and pronounced that seriously. Stefan, whose back was leaning against a swivel chair, pondered on it for a bit, and then looked at him askins. Really? It probably is, his assistant replied. Because that's what these books say. Read it aloud for me, the man ordered. The assistant nodded. Be the person, a man or a woman, 
when he or she sees his or her partner frequently in the company of the opposite sex, he or she will not help but feel irrational. In psychology, this is termed as jealousy. Continue. The boss inclined his head for him to go on. The assistant hurriedly lowered his head and read aloud the words in the book accordingly. Based on several studies about the topic, the following are the criteria of a jealous person. First, it's the lack of confidence in oneself. No, I don't deserve him. He's way more interesting than me, has better qualifications, etc. Second, another form of jealousy is the opposite of that, which is narcissism and selfishness. He requires a constant affirmation of affection. The idea of a possible love rival can evoke a strong sense of suspicion and rebuke in him like that of a selfish person. Such baseless accusation can make him feel wronged and weary at first, but later it will evolve to become an insult, which will nearly be unbearable for him. Stefan fell into a stupor. Why was the last description of the symptom that Harry had read aloud more apt to describe his behavior? Him flying into a towering rage when he saw Martin and her kiss that day? Could that be an expression of jealousy as well? Was it not a certainty for one to feel angry when witnessing his woman be with another man? He leaned forward a little abruptly and clasped his hands together with his brows tightly knitted. Harry. Yes, boss? He inquired rather hesitantly. Is it normal for a man to be jealous of a woman? His assistant was surprised, and immediately he lowered his head to let his fingertips fly through the pages. The man was shocked by the dexterity of his fingers. His assistant seriously perused the content of a page and recited it in a silver voice straight away. A relationship without jealousy is non-existent. Jealousy regarding love is a condiment, nourishment even. Furthermore, usually the extent of one's jealousy is directly related to the extent of one's love. Therefore, reflect upon the past and ponder about the current situation again. If you have never felt a bit of jealousy in the course of your relationship, wouldn't this so-called love be very dubious? The only benchmark to test the truth is through the application. Similarly, the benchmark to test if you're truly in love with a person is through jealousy. This means that one feels jealousy toward another because he loves her and cares for her? The man extracted the gist out of that long-winded explanation. His assistant nodded after some consideration. You can say that. His brows furrowed and his eyes drooped. He appeared to be in deep thought. All of a sudden, he lifted an uncertain and baffled gaze onto his assistant. The latter felt shivers down his spine at his superior's penetrating stare at him. Harry? Yes, boss? Have you been in love before? No. His boss hit a nerve, and thereafter, he piteously shook his head. You've actually never been in love before. The man sized him up from head to toe in slight disdain. He treated a person who had never been in love before as his mentor in love psychology? The assistant, however, confidently retorted, Boss, I have yet to earn money for marriage. Dare I fall in love? The chairman cocked a brow in dissatisfaction and stared at his assistant coldly. Drumming his knuckles on the table, he stated, If you want a raise, tell me directly. The assistant truthfully requested, Boss, I want a raise. He shrugged his request off pronto. Rejected. The assistant responded with a hopeless expression. He, however, did not concern himself with the bitterness radiating off in waves from his assistant and probed further. How does a woman show jealousy toward a man? The assistant reluctantly dipped his head again and unenthusiastically flipped through the book. He then read off the book word for word. When a woman feels jealous, first she will ignore her partner. He nodded. That woman blacklisted his number while he was overseas for a few days. Second, she will show disinterest. He nodded again. That woman was indeed very disinterested in him. She was cold and indifferent. Could this be her way of expressing her affection toward him? Third, she easily loses her cool. 
90% of women express this. He knocked his fingers on the desk. Continue. Episode 307 Legitimate Love Fourth, she will close herself off while spitting sarcastic remarks, knowingly or unknowingly. It seems to be like this. She will compare herself with another woman. He stroked his chin thoughtfully. The questioning words she had spoken with puffy eyes reverberated in his head once more. If I belong to you, then what about you? Do you belong to Gracia? Huh. She will feel down, becoming broken as she weeps bitterly. His subordinate listed off all the reasons that a jealous woman would often show. Most of them fit his woman's previous actions. That woman blacklisted his number, treated him indifferently, kept her distance from him, made snide remarks about him while remaining impassive, and even compared herself to another woman. All of those were signs of jealousy according to the psychology book. He naturally substituted this into an equation. Jealousy equals love. Was that woman jealous of him because she loved him? This realization had him puckering his lips into a smile. The frost in his eyes gradually receded, and joy faintly emerged from within. Harry raised his head and watched his boss's excitement and contentment in shock. The man returned to himself quickly after, only to realize that his assistant was looking at him in such a bare manner. Hastily withdrawing the smile on his lips, he cleared his throat and sent a glum glare at him. Uh, continue reading. The latter gathered his wits and dared not to look at his superior any longer. A man must be in control of his emotions and respect his partner's feelings. He should keep in mind that she is not his private property. She is my private property, he corrected, feeling rather displeased. She has the right to be in a relationship and to fall in love with another. He swiftly cut him off, shooting daggers at him. She has no right to be in a relationship with anyone else besides me. And all the more, she has no right to love another. The oppressive aura he effused made his subordinate shut his mouth for a long while. Boss, is that book authentic? He asked skeptically. How can there be such an absurd description? It is. His assistant turned to another page and added, It says here, Jealousy may be a reflection of one's affection, but it vastly contrasts with true love. There is only one way out of jealousy. Use love to gain affection and to redeem one's relationship. Use love to gain affection. He could not help pondering on this, as he leaned against his chair. From the expression he showed, he seemed to be considering it seriously. Do women firmly insist on marriage? What is a typical woman's opinion on marriage? The assistant shook his head in bafflement. I don't know. He loved to answer that question as well. Alas, he did not have a girlfriend. His boss sent him a glare. If you don't know, then hurry up and investigate. He hurriedly fished out a book titled Marriage Psychology and quietly skimmed through its pages. Being in a relationship is easy, but staying committed is difficult. The biggest difference between these two is that a person looks at his or her partner's good points when in a relationship, while a person must embrace the other's weak points once married. In marriage, communication is often the issue. This is usually due to the disparity between a man and a woman's perception of marriage. He nodded thoughtfully. Love is everything to a woman, whereas it is only a small part to a man's life. A man's accomplishments from success in his career and the rise in his social status. Love is simply a method to relieve himself in his loneliness. As for a woman, her accomplishments largely originate from a man's concern and love for her. Love can be a woman's driving force in life. Is that so? Stefan mumbled, doubtful. His subordinate dared not guarantee anything. Oh, well, it's hard to read the minds of women. 
I don't know much to. He asked. Marriage is just a piece of paper. Why do women see it as a form of security? He really could not fathom how a woman's mind worked. He was really puzzled by all this. Isn't it still possible to divorce after marriage? Carefully considering it, Harry shared his opinion. I don't think it's just about having a sense of security for a woman. Rather, I think it's the desire of a woman for a man's love toward her to be legitimate. The man lightly rubbed his forefinger against his thumb. Thousands of thoughts flashed across his mind, yet he did not voice aloud any of them. Boss, don't you know how to appease a woman? His assistant slyly blinked at him. Shall I teach you a method? Go on. His assistant quickly went over and whispered into his ear for a while. Upon hearing the method, he looked at him with doubt. Does it really work? Of course it does. Women like romance. He regarded him with pursed lips. You shall make the arrangements. All right. Crystal Estate Monica locked herself in the bedroom for the whole day. She wanted to go home, but when she approached the door, she was stopped by a servant. This picturesque and scenic villa, a treasured piece of land in the suburbs, away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Past the gate, one would see the sprawling, faraway hilly road, which mendered for thousands of miles. Because it was a private estate, there was basically no public transport available. If she stubbornly insisted on leaving, she would have to walk all the way down the mountain to catch the first cab. She suffered from pent-up frustrations. Stefan, what did that man mean by leaving her alone in this villa and disappearing by himself? What is he up to? In the afternoon, Andres called to ask if her filming went well. Naturally, she kept silent about her not being with the production team anymore. She originally had a schedule today, but after the fiasco involving that domineering man last night, who knew what the production team thought of her now? What the production director thought of her? She tried to muster up the courage to call James to apologize. Due to her personal matter, the entire filming schedule was delayed, and she felt very guilty about it. This was especially after Stefan had violently pushed him to the ground. He probably got hurt. What about Martin? He probably got hurt too. The production would probably be on hiatus because of this. This made her feel guilty. She resented Stefan's irrationality. In the evening, there was a knock on the bedroom door. She covered herself with the comforter and ignored the knock. A series of knocks came from outside the door for a bit before the butler's polite voice was heard. Miss Monica, are you asleep? Yes, I am, she answered with vexation. It was yet again silent at the door. Following this, the light clinking of keys sounded. She sat bolt upright in bed at that, slipped on her slippers, and walked to the just unlocked door. She grumbled, Didn't I say that I'm asleep? Miss Monica, don't you want to go home? The stunned butler asked with some trepidation. Episode 308, Dating, Part 1 Monica was startled. You'll send me home? Yes, the butler explained. The chairman called earlier to let us send you home. Her face went blank. She did not know why there was a tinge of disappointment in her heart upon hearing of the man's order. It faded away very quickly, though. It was his order to take me home. Yes. The butler then handed over the dress she was holding carefully in her hands to Monica. This is from the chairman. If you don't mind, we will help you change into it. What is this? She eyed the small black dress. It was an exquisite Chanel haute couture dress. It must have cost a fortune. The dress was more for a casual party of socialites rather than a formal gathering of professionals with its simple yet elegant design. She could not help but frown. I don't want it. She would not wear clothes given by him. The butler panicked at this. Miss Monica, this... 
He repeatedly ordered us to let you change into it. If you don't, Miss Monica... Uh, please don't make it difficult for us. She answered in a fit of pique. I don't want. Tell him that I don't like it. Is it the design that you don't like? The butler inquired. This design was personally selected by the president. They too thought that she would look beautiful in the dress. I don't like this design, she coldly stated. The chairman did not only send this piece. If Miss Monica doesn't like this, there are a few other pieces you can choose from. With that, the butler summoned in the row of fashion clerks, dressed in well-made uniforms that were waiting outside the door. They paraded in turn before her with a piece of haute couture of different designs and styles, each for her selection. Aren't you supposed to be sending me home? Why have me change clothes then? Where's Stefan? What is he after? She felt a spark of anger ignite in her at not knowing what the man wanted from her. The crowd exchanged glances and shook their heads in perplexity. The chairman only gave us the order to assist you in getting dressed and boarding the car. Your ride is already waiting outside. She quickly walked up to the window, pulled the drapes aside, and saw a luxury limousine parked in the courtyard. She was at a loss for a moment. She really could not understand what Stefan's intention was. When she turned around again to face these employees that were in a tight spot because of her, she sighed and extended her hand out to point to that slim black dress. Forget it. I'll not make things difficult for you. Just this one. I'll change into it on my own. The servant's faces immediately brightened up. Leaving the dress behind, they swiftly departed from the room. She changed into the dress and looked at herself in the vanity mirror. Not only did the little black dress accentuate her elegance and slender curves, it also showed off her fair skin. Her silky black hair cascaded from her shoulders straight to her waist. It brought out the air of regal beauty. The moment she opened the door, the stylists outside quickly surrounded her. From hairstyle to makeup, jewelry and high heels, all these undoubtedly made up a huge project. She sensed something was off. Just what are you all doing? Equally baffled, the stylists unanimously shook their heads. She found this matter to be very bizarre, but she could not guess what the man had in mind. The Bentley slowly parked at the car park on an island. This island, which was artificially made two years ago, was now a popular landmark in the capital. A restaurant was situated on the island. The scenic view from it was perfect for those poetic and artistic at heart. Bali Island Western Restaurant This capital's top western restaurant had a very romantic ambiance, perfect for couples. Per week, this restaurant hosted only one pair of lovers as guests. Rumors had it that this was the most expensive restaurant across the capital. Either the contents of the menu or glasses of fine wine were extremely luxurious. Hence, many hearsays claim that Bali Island's couple package was worth at least 10 million. When Monica first heard of their reputation, she found it to be greatly overblown. How could anyone be so stupid to spend 10 million for a single Western meal? However, as she alighted from the car with the skirt's hemline in her hand, she was surprised to see the magnificent cruise ship moored on the shore. It was so beautiful. Now that it was nighttime, the entire island was embraced by colorful lights. It was extremely romantic. As the evening breeze picked up, a floral fragrance wafted in the air. The blooming flowers by the shore blanketed the area like an expensive carpet. The stars in the night sky, coupled with the star lanterns, decorated the lake. The scenery was absolutely breathtaking. She could not help but be fascinated by this romantic view as she walked along the lakeside. The floral fragrance, the nightscape, the starlights, all kept her entranced, and by the time she came to herself, the car had already left. What was his intention by doing this? Why was she left alone here? Her heart pounded as she looked at her surroundings and found a dock nearby. The nightscape of the island was very beautiful. That was not all. At the lakeside, there was a dock holding several small cruise ships. Once on board, one could easily travel around the island. Although tickets were expensive, people still came in droves. Hence, there was a long line at the dock right now. 
Many were waiting for their turn to board the ships and tour around the island while basking in the beautiful night scene. She was now even more confused. Just what was that man up to? Dulling her up and then leaving her alone in this place? How would she get back to the city? She supposed that she could catch a public bus here, but she had nothing on her. Her phone and her wallet were not with her. She started to feel depressed. Catching sight of someone by the dock, she thought she could go up and ask for directions to see if there was any way to return to the city from here. Hence, she walked in the direction of the dock. Halfway there, as she was walking anxiously without paying much attention to her surroundings, she bumped into a woman and knocked the latter's phone onto the ground. She hurriedly apologized and picked up the person's phone. However, the woman impatiently shouted, Psst, what's wrong with you? Don't you look at where you're going? Really? She frowned at that, but did not wish to argue with this passerby and focused only on picking up the phone. When she lifted her head to look at the woman, she was quite shocked. It was her. This woman was not just anyone. She was that person she had seen at the hospital that day. Haley. Why would she see her here? She froze on the spot, a hint of doubt and surprise showing on her face. This was way too much of a coincidence. Haley originally intended to cruise around the island to view the nightscape with her friends. After they bought the tickets, they found out that they still needed to queue. Hence, they decided to walk along with the lakeside first and enjoy the nightscape. However, she was knocked by someone and her phone, which was not tightly held, dropped to the ground. Episode 309 Dating Part 2 Haley's temperament was volatile. She was just about to explode when she caught sight of the person's face as the latter lifted her head. It was Monica. After the shock, doubt surfaced on her face. Undoubtedly, she recognized this woman with a glance. That day, Stefan's phone call display was of this woman's sleeping face. Her stunning beauty was all natural, unlike those actresses that had gone under the knife. Either her appearance or her disposition was very distinctive. Despite seeing that photo of her just once, she could still not forget about it. The only difference was that the woman before her wore an elegant black dress on her body and light, sophisticated makeup on her face. Her face was a bit more distinctive than the one in the picture. She was much more fetching in real life. It was a fact that she did not want to admit to herself. It was no wonder that Brother Lewis seemed to be very fond of this woman. This was the type of woman that men preferred. An elegant appearance and a clean and refined disposition. Even if she were a man, she would be just as mesmerizing. Why would she appear here, though? Monica stared at Haley with shock and started to hold suspicion. Naturally, she did not know that the latter had seen a photo of her on the man's phone before. She just thought that the latter was mad about the bumping incident, so she hurriedly returned the phone to her. I'm sorry, it was an accident. Please check if the phone is damaged. Haley retrieved the phone from her and inspected it. The phone did not seem to have suffered any damage from the fall. Since there was no damage on it, she turned around to leave. The woman called out to her. Monica! She shouted her name. Monica was startled and turned around confusedly. How did she know my name? They had not officially met yet. I didn't get the wrong person, did I? Haley lifted her chin haughtily and strode toward her domineeringly. That is your name, right? She had the habit of scrolling through Instagram, and on one particular day, the Forbidden Love production team posted a set of makeup photos, which topped the search rank in no time. Only when she clicked it and saw Monica did she learn of her name. Monica. She recalled that the villa estate the Lewis family had developed was named Crystal. Was it just a coincidence, or did Brother Lewis especially name it after this woman? Haley then followed the Instagram page of The Forbidden Love. Ever since the production started, Monica's behind-the-scenes footage had the highest number of views. It was obvious that this woman was not ordinary. Yes, my name is Monica Thames. You are? She looked at her and politely asked for her name. 
You don't deserve to know my name. Haley crossed her arms around her chest and presented herself with extreme arrogance. The polite smile vacated Monica's face in an instant. What a haughty woman. She curled up her lips lightly. <sighs> That's fine. I'm not interested anyway. As if she was really curious in the first place. She could not be bothered to stoop to her level. Haley choked upon hearing her words. <sighs> you. Is there anything else? She plastered a graceful smile on her lips. If there's none, I'll take my leave now. Stop her right there! Seeing that she was truly about to leave, Haley grinded her teeth and stomped her feet in anger. She chased after Monica and clasped her on the shoulder. As Monica's dress was off shoulders, Haley's freshly manicured nails, which were extremely sharp, and not to mention, the latter had used a lot of strength in her grip, she left deep marks on her shoulder in no time. What are you doing? Monica was now angered and shrugged her shoulder to dislodge Haley's hand. The woman was being ridiculous. The woman's glare seemed to express her desire to swallow her. With a sneer, Haley retorted, Did I allow you to leave? Strange, just who are you for me to listen to you? She found her even more ridiculous now. Are you sick in the head? Ha! Haley laughed in her anger and crossed her arms against her chest again as she glared at her with loathing. Monica, you should consider your identity. With your lowly status, you dare to talk to me in this manner? Miss, what does my identity have to do with you? With such a haughty look, I think that you were a royal princess of another country. But your upbringing said otherwise. I doubt you even received a proper education on etiquette. She mercilessly countered, rendering Haley speechless in defeat. Given Monica's fragile and harmless look, she did not expect her to have such a sharp tongue. Haley's lips curled. She took a step toward her, scanning her body with insidious eyes, and laughed derisively. Look at you. You're nothing much yourself. At most, you're just a pretty face that is able to seduce men. Who knows what you really are on the inside? How cheap you must be. Who do you think you are? Do you really think that by wearing such a dress, you can be a part of the upper class society? Dream on. Commoners are commoners. Don't ever harbor the thought of marrying into a rich family. Monica was startled and confused by her sarcasm. She wondered in what manner had she offended this lady for her to be so rude. Haley continued, These days, the third party can actually be so righteous after getting between other people's marriage. It really is an eye-opener. I don't know what you're talking about. You do. She gripped her wrist and viciously spat. Bitch! You really like to seduce men, right? Despite knowing that Brother Lewis has a fiancé, you still shamelessly stick to him. Don't you feel embarrassed? What are you talking? Monica pried her hand away and then paused at her words. In hindsight, she finally knew who this woman meant by Brother Lewis. Thus, she also understood the underlying meaning of her vicious words. Stefan. How could she have forgotten that this woman was his niece? Still, how did she know her? Did he mention her to his niece? What did he say to her? Monica's face soured. I advise you to retain some pride as a woman. Brother Stefan already has a fiancé. You'd better stay far away from him. If Grandpa Lewis learns of this, he won't ever let you off. His niece warned in disgust. The disdain in her eyes could almost brand her skin. Although Monica was furious, she appeared calm when she looked her right in the eye. She had no intention to back down. Carefully observing Haley's face, she saw naked jealousy from it. This bare jealousy almost needed no cover-up. Was she jealous? Generally, for a woman to have such a cruel and envious look, the man should occupy a very important place in her heart. Did she like him?
Episode 310 You're in love with your uncle. Did she like him? Pursing her lips, Monica recalled when she bumped into that scene of the two at the hospital. The woman was embracing and reveling in his doting love. The happiness she exhibited on her face was not the kind of adoration one would have for her brother. Her look spoke volumes of her possessiveness and amorous desire. An attachment she sought, but could not get. There was no doubt that she liked her uncle. Her liking could not be obvious. It was suppressed more or less by social norm. Still, deep down, her feelings for her uncle was not a simple familial love. Monica got a better idea of this woman's thoughts right now. Although she accused her of being the third party, in fact, she herself yearned to be the woman standing by his side and not as his niece. With this newly found knowledge, she smiled at her competitor and slowly uttered, I believe you've got something wrong here. What? Haley looked at her with a start. I'm not the mistress that messed with their marriage. Cocking a brow, she displayed a cool and elegant smile. Stefan is only engaged right now. What he has is merely a fiancé. Is he married yet? I don't think so. How can you say that I'm destroying their marriage? Brother Lewis is already engaged to Gracia, the latter blurted out angrily. Her choice of word did not escape her, though. Gracia. She had addressed her by name directly without any qualms. This might be because she could not accept that woman as her uncle's fiancé. She added, So what if they're engaged? It's only an engagement ordered by the family elders. He doesn't feel any love for the other party. How is this considered as me coming between them, huh? Her sneer thoroughly antagonized Haley. That pushed her to rap blatantly. Ha! Huh. You're too naive for your own good. Do you think Brother Lewis really likes you? He's just toying with you. Oh, come on. You really think that you can take this chance to earn a title and marry into a rich family? The Lewis is the top elite family in the capital. Grandpa Lewis won't ever let an actress enter the family. Are you thinking of marrying him? You'd be better off buying a pillow for your daydream as that'd be more realistic, huh? She was clearly jeering at her for having such notion. Her niece's flagrant mocking was like driving a needle, dipped with salt, into her heart, causing her to feel unbearable pain. Despite the pain she was experiencing inside, Monica toughened herself up and maintained her gracious smile. What of that? You! Haley was aghast with the former's lack of shame and berated. Shameless! Well, let's say that your words are right. Pouting her lips innocently, Monica threw her a sympathetic look to hint that she knew of the latter's immoral affection for her uncle, and continued resignedly, I'm here to marry the rich, to snatch your brother Louis, that is Gracia's fiancé, and I'm the third party. Still, a brief moment passed, and then she looked up with a sharp glare at her. What can you do about that? You! Haley lifted her palm high and sent a hard slap to her face. Monica caught her wrist halfway, though. She looked meek and feeble, so the other woman did not expect her to possess this much strength. In fact, when she clenched her hand, a row of deep red marks appeared on Haley's fair wrist. She, when truly antagonized, was akin to a ferocious kitten, which would swing its claws and return unimaginable pain to its aggressor. Why? Are you resorting to violence now since you can't win the argument? What an ill-mannered missy. With that, she jerked off her hand. Haley, who was caught off guard, lost her balance from her pull and fell to the ground. Huh, interesting. You're Stefan's niece, right? She walked toward her casually. Looking down at the woman on the ground, she sarcastically remarked, Oh my, look at the jealous look you have on your face now. Don't tell me that you like Stefan, no? Her offhand comment reeked of thinly disguised sarcasm. Haley's face turned white with alarm at her direct question. Unlike men, women could read one another well. He might be unable to tell, but she was not equally as blind. His niece was obviously in love with him. 
Her strong and sweet adoration could not be concealed. She could tell this with one look. This was even more when there was now panic and shame on the woman's face. She really did hit the nail on the head, huh? Shaking her head, she sighed wistfully. So this is the real story. You're in love with your uncle. It's none of your business. The other woman craned her neck and retorted sharply. With the man's knees on the ground, while Monica bore down on her, the former was robbed of her earlier dominance. The woman hastily tried to stand up, but she reached her leg forward and aimed her fine tapering stiletto on her hand. His knee screamed and retracted her hand, her ashen face winced in pain. You're so pathetic, Monica continued, mocking the other with a face devoid of feeling. He is your uncle, and you are his niece. This is incest. What a shock. You! The latter's face sank all of a sudden upon hearing that. Look, you fall in love with a man, but this man turns out to be your uncle. It's impossible for you to be with him in this lifetime. Isn't that pathetic? She then added nonchalantly. I'm different from you, though. I'm with him, and even have a child with him. Wide-eyed, Haley stared at her unbelievably when she heard that. Looking at her pale-looking face, Monica regained her confidence as she admired the infliction she had caused, and then went on casually, What about you? What about you? They were uncle and niece. As close relations, being together would be incestuous. Haley was stunned momentarily. She stared blankly at her face before she suddenly reacted. Monica's eyes and brows, as well as the shape of her lips, were so alike with Sam. To be exact, Sam's eyes and brows inherited her softness and beauty. She did not pay heed to these details initially, so they escaped her notice. This realization shocked her beyond words. Don't tell me. Sam is her and Stefan's child? This cognition was too big a blow for her almost sending her into the fiery pits of hell. Who is the one having wishful thinking and daydreaming here? Do you think that, without me, you can be with the man you love? She let out a jeer that seemed to speak of the other's naivety. Now, that is ridiculous. Shut up! Shut up! You keep your mouth shut! Haley went into hysterics, covering her eyes to block out the sarcastic words. Covering her smile with her palm, Monica kept to her elegant demeanor and lady etiquette, unlike her opponent who had lost control of herself. She told her neutrally, Do you know what Stefan told me about you? Continue pouring salt on the bloody wound of the man's knees. It seems that you're nothing to him at all if he can cut ties with you for a woman whom he's just playing with. Your devotion toward him has gone to waste. Haley lost control of herself, and she howled up, Shut up, you bitch! With that, she threw herself ferociously at her in an attempt to strangle her to death. At this moment, after being repeatedly spotted by this woman before her, she was no longer in full control of herself. She was hell-bent on teaching this bitch a lesson today. Monica was unbothered by this. Simply leaning slightly to the side and stretching out her foot, she caused Haley, who was blinded by anger, to take a tumble to the floor just like a dog with mud on its mouth. The ground was made of cement and was uneven with gravel. With this fall, the man's niece, her skimpy dress, broke the skin on her knees with tiny beads of blood seeping out of them. There were also bloody abrasions on her palms. How disheveled she looked presently! Haley looked down and saw the terrible wounds on her knees. In the Pierce family, she was always pampered with love like a princess. Before the birth of Tessa Pierce, she was the apple of the eye of her family. Doted on by her parents and brother alike, she had never suffered any grievances. Even after the birth of her youngest sibling, her parents' love for her did not diminish. Her arrogant temperament was due to being spoiled rotten by them. With their loving princess treatment of her, she had white, flawless skin and became rather vain about not letting herself get hurt. Alas, now, as she bowed her head, her knees were covered in wounds she found too tragic to look at. Stubbornly glaring at the other, she howled mournfully, Monica, 
You shameless bitch! Tears rolled down her face, ruining her meticulously done makeup into uneven smudges. Yes, that's it. Monica smiled elegantly at her. I like seeing you in this manner. How you hate me, but still can't get rid of me. A single statement that was wicked, yet elegant. It stunned Haley for a moment. With wide eyes, she sized up this woman, and when she felt her heart tense up, she clenched her teeth. You! Oh, this bitch! Smack! Monica sent a tight slap to her face. This left Haley's stunning face reeling. Cradling her stinging cheek, she could hardly believe it. She was hit by someone. Monica sneered. Huh? Did your parents not teach you anything? How, how dare you hit me? Her eyes were flushed with anger. Smack! The other just laughed and sent her another tight slap. At this point, she was completely stunned. Shall I slap you to let you see how many times I dare? Monica emotionlessly pulled up her sleeves. Just as the man's niece wanted to retaliate, she gracefully turned around and left. Stop! Haley clenched her teeth and stood up from the ground to chase after her. A hint of annoyance showed on Monica's face. She just did not know when to stop. The dispute between them was witnessed by a server at the dock. His eyes locked onto Monica and on her black off-shoulder dress, as well as her waist-length silky hair and exquisite makeup. He knew there and then that she was the VIP he was tasked to wait for tonight. As such, he hurried over and interrupted the catfight. Hello, are you Miss Monica? She faced this newcomer and saw that it was a smartly dressed man with a polite disposition and smiled. Hello, yes I am. May I know who you are? Miss Thames, I'm in charge of Bali Island Western Restaurant. You are our guest tonight. I'm here to escort you. She was momentarily dazed. Haley was also stunned at the back. Bali Island? She was very astonished. Was she here for a date? Bali Island's couple package was worth at least 10 to 13 million. This was a lot of money, even in the whole capital. By word of mouth, this restaurant was the ultimate dream of many counterparts. A meal here comprised eight delicacies, complemented by aged wines. From cutlery to interior decoration, everything was exquisitely made. Rumors had it that, before a meal, one could take a 30-minute helicopter ride overlooking the island, and one would also receive 10,000 roses during the meal. This alone attracted many women. Being able to date in Bali Island was a sign of prestige. Who was the man she was going on a date here? Her chest felt stifled. Is it Brother Lewis? Monica was a little surprised as well, but she at least knew who had made this arrangement. She squinted at the man's niece, then faced the waiter and politely smiled. All right, I'll follow you then. Wait! Haley, with a livid face, shouted. You! Are you dating Brother Lewis? She turned to look at her expressionlessly. A date? He would go on a date with her? She could not imagine that he would actually use his spare time for a date. Hence, she dared not confirm that the man's arrangement was a date. She wanted to see her looking stricken and confused, though. So she sneeringly replied quite vaguely, Yes, I'm going on a date, so don't follow me anymore. It's annoying to look at you. Episode 312 Welcome to Bali Island Western Restaurant. Haley flew into a rage out of humiliation. She was about to step forward again, but she was stopped on the spot by the timely appearance of the bodyguards. Security at the restaurant was tight. Hence, under the bodyguards' obstruction, she could only watch her board a cruise ship. To get to Bali Island Western Restaurant, the primary mode of transport was aboard a cruise ship. Therefore, it was much more extravagant than the others. Hence, when Monica boarded the cruise ship to Bali Island with the assistance of the server, she garnered the exclamations of that sightseeing at the dock. For a moment, jealous, amazed, and envious comments could be heard. Oh, heavens! 
Is that Bali Island private cruise ship? How luxurious! My god! <gasps> Bali Island! That's a dream come true! Monica stood before the railings. She lowered her head and looked at the constantly rising waves. The reflection of the star lanterns of the cruise ship on the lake was beautiful. On the horizon, the silver moon seemed like a hook. Standing on the deck, Monica hugged her shoulders as she felt a little chilly. The server immediately thoughtfully put a coat on her. She politely thanked him, but even though she had the coat, only her body was warmed. Her heart still felt cold. The Lewis is the top elite family in the capital. Grandpa Lewis won't ever let an actress enter the family. Are you thinking of marrying him? You'd be better off buying a pillow for your daydream, as that'd be more realistic. Do you think Brother Lewis really likes you? He's just toying with you. Oh, come on. Do you really think that you can take this chance to earn a title and marry into a rich family? These days, the third party can actually be so righteous after getting between other people's marriage. The third party? Her lips curled up, and she laughed coldly. It was ludicrous. How did she become the third party? Everything that Gracia had all belonged to her in the first place. She was the real third party. No. She stole the token left behind by her mother. She stole her identity. She stole her family. She stole her fiancé. Was that woman not the third party? How did it become her? She was not the third party. All the things that were in Gracia's possession originally belonged to her. In that case, she just had to take back everything she owned. Although she did not care for all that, she would certainly not let an imposter encroach on her territory and flaunt it before her. Recalling that woman's repulsive face, she felt disgusted from the bottom of her heart. All the accumulation of accusations and grievances for over a decade came pouring into her heart. She swore that she would take back all that belonged to her. The cruise ship soon reached the dock of the island. She alighted from the cruise ship, and Bali's island server astutely greeted her. Hello, Miss Thames. Welcome to Bali Island Western Restaurant. The restaurant only had one private room. She turned to ask the server, Who booked this restaurant? Where is the person? Doubt crept into her heart. Just what was that man scheming of now? He had brought her here. He did not show up himself. A few servers exchanged smiles. She noticed their secretive behavior and raised a brow, simply past caring. She toured around the private room alone and incidentally discovered that there was an observation deck inside too. She was attracted to the Hubble Space Telescope on the observation deck. Is that a telescope? She pointed to it. She was pretty clueless about astronomy. Hence, she was unsure if the instrument was really a telescope. The server behind her smilingly answered, Yes, there's news of a meteor shower tonight. Miss Thames, would you like to look through it? All right, she happily agreed. She was quite interested in the telescope. Incredible. Usually... One could only see the few sporadic stars scattered across the night sky. However, through the telescope, she could see plenty of them, and they were in fact of different sizes. Some were so tiny like sand particles, while others were so big and even pulsated blue or orange. A handful was even like brilliant diamonds hanging in the sky, utterly mesmerizing. The stars together made up the beautiful constellations. They were breathtakingly captivating. She was completely fascinated. She realized now why there were many astronomy enthusiasts. Indeed, one could not help but be fascinated by the starry night sky. Completely entranced by the stars, she did not notice that the server behind her had already left the private room quietly. She was still rapidly observing the night sky when a bright shooting star streaked across the lens. It disappeared in the blink of an eye. Still, she was ecstatic. 
This was her first time seeing a falling star since she became an adult. She exclaimed and lifted her hat in joy. I saw a shooting star! Turning around to announce this, she bumped into a warm and sturdy chest instead. Her forehead was a little sore. She shut her eyes on reflex as she held her slightly aching head. Raising her head as she opened her eyes, a shooting star seemed to shoot past when a diamond necklace dangled before her in all its brilliance. Episode 313 Are You Still Mad at Me? Monica could not help but notice the exquisite workmanship done on the diamond, which was carefully carved into the shape of a shooting star. And just like that celestial object, the pendant was dazzling at one glance. She was startled at the sight of it. It was unknown when exactly, but Stefan now stood before her. In this haughty and aloof man's dark orbs was a tenderness that he never had before. Her heart felt that everything about tonight might be his specially arranged surprise. What made her the most surprised was that she did not think that he would spend his time on a date with her. From what she knew, his time was gold. Controlling such a large conglomerate like Makewealth was definitely no easy task. Still, although she had her suspicion, she still did not expect him to prepare this much. For a moment, she felt stupid. Did he know that he had gone overboard last night? So he set this mysterious date to surprise her and make up for it? She was the only woman he was willing to devote all his mind to. He had never put so much effort into anything like this before. This truly was his first time. While many aspects of this date were based on Harry's suggestions, that was only because he did not know how a woman's mind worked. What did she like? What did she not like? Clueless about anything, he could only rely on his subordinate's advice and fumble around. Stefan's eyes never left hers. He saw the astonishment in her enchanting peach eyes over the diamond pendant dangling before her. Did this man specially prepare all these because he felt sorry about last night and wanted to make amends? She secretly cursed to herself and lifted her eyes to check his expression furtively. Like it? His low voice came out of his mouth. She kept her silence. The anger in his eyes reminded her of his cruelty last night, and her resentment toward him was evoked. Her vision fell on the stunning pendant again. No matter how hard she tried to keep the cold dark on her lips, she still smiled at this unexpected surprise. Judging from the twinkle in her eyes, he presumed that she liked the surprise a lot. Women were weak to such surprises indeed. Thus, he took her by the shoulders, turned her around, and moved to put the pendant around her neck. She broke free from him in a matter of seconds. After this brief display of intimacy, she was back to being indifferent. In his eyes, she appeared to still be mad at him. You don't like it? He seemed to be inquiring for her opinion. She glanced at the pendant in his hand, and then shook her head coldly. He was too naive. He could easily see through her stubborn defiance. This woman was obviously still angry with him. From the look in her eyes... He could tell that she liked this pendant very much. She was still waging a cold war with him. He smiled mischievously. Since you don't like it, I'll throw it away. Before she could respond, he strode to the edge of the observation deck and hurled the pendant in his hand into the lake. The observation deck was very close to the lake. The strength of his hand was not to be underestimated as well. So as soon as it was thrown... The pendant disappeared in the blink of an eye. She sneaked a glimpse and happened to catch this very action. Her heart dropped, and not bothering to reserve her composure, she walked anxiously over to his side and peered in the direction of where he had thrown the jewelry. It was nowhere to be seen. Her heart fumed. Angrily biting her lower lip, she turned around and pushed him hard. Why did you do that? Oh, what did I do? He looked at her with an innocent face, 
as if he could not quite wrap his head around what he had just done. Ridiculous! Why did you throw my pendant into the lake? Is that a joke? She was pissed. You said that you dislike it. His tone was hushed, and his look was penetrating, silently reminding her of her earlier words. She disliked the pendant, so he threw it away. She was stuck for words for once. You threw it away just because I said that I don't like it? Since you don't like it, it loses its value. The man raised his haughty chin as he declared this matter-of-factly. He seemed to be telling her that that stunning jewelry's value was not measured by its cost, but by her liking. She did not like it, so the pendant lost its worth. The loss of a worthless object would not be a pity. She knitted her brows in deep forlorn and frustration. It was true that she had said that she did not like it, but was it really what she felt inside? Actually, she liked that gorgeous pendant from the bottom of her heart. It was just that she did not want to forgive him so readily. Why is he so dense when it comes to reading a woman's mind? The truth was that she really liked it. Very much, indeed. She could tell that he had taken much effort into selecting that jewelry for her. Every angle of that pendant was delicate. Be it the cut or the polished shine. It must have cost a bomb, too. He had carefully prepared such an exquisite surprise for her tonight. In any case, for her, what she really wanted was a statement from him about his last night's attitude. Just a simple word of apology to her would be greatly appreciated. He was too proud for that, though. Now, he threw away an expensive pendant just from her insincere utterance. More importantly, she really liked it. She stared at him without expression. In her anger and annoyance, she simply looked away from, as she intended to ignore him for good. She sulkily turned away without a second look at him. Her heart was undulating tumultuously as she pouted and watched the calm lake surface. He chuckled softly as he watched her behavior. He walked toward her back, and his long, slender legs hugged close to her hemline. She turned her head and gave him a warning look. Her zipped lips and stern eyes seemed to caution him to keep his distance from her. She was apparently still simmering with anger. He let off another chuckle, knowing well that she was fuming now. Instead of keeping his distance, he drew closer to her. Bowing slightly, he rested his chin on her nape. His breath blew warm on her cheek as he asked, Why? Are you still mad at me? Episode 314 Forbidden from Taking It Off No, I'm not, Monica retorted coldly, brushing aside his affection. Her tone belied her words, though, as she sounded deeply displeased. Stefan reckoned that she was pissed off because he had carelessly thrown away the jewelry. With a smile, he pressed close to her ear and intimately panted, Little liar, you're obviously angry. I don't dare to be angry with you, almighty CEO Lewis, she sniggered jestingly. In fact, you like that pendant, right? His statement hit the jackpot as his gaze locked onto her fuming face. It belongs to you, so you can do whatever you want with it. What has that got to do with me? She told him off brashly. She did not realize that their exchange and behavior right now were plain flirting. He smiled and knew deep down that she was playing hard to get. She was rather dumb, though, and not thinking at the same time. Did she really think that he could not tell how much she liked this pendant? The man slowly opened his palm. As if by magic, the necklace that he had supposedly thrown away rested quietly in the center of his palm, exuding a charming and gentle sheen under the bright moonbeam. In fact, he could tell what she was thinking with just a look. She did not mean it when she said that she did not like it. It was just how a woman would behave when angry. He could also tell that what she felt was the opposite. She liked it a lot. He was just bluffing when he mimed throwing the necklace away. 
She fell for his fake action of throwing the necklace into the lake, hook, line, and sinker, though. Her anxious look could not escape his eyes. Standing behind her, he gently swept her hair aside to reveal the porcelain-like fair skin on her nape. His eyes gave sparks as his back stiffened somewhat. Her soft, fair, and flawless skin were like a masterpiece, especially right now when the dark water surface, which was reflecting the pale moonlight, was accentuating her jade-like skin. She was a stunning beauty from inside and outside. The classy black gown she was wearing contrasted with her snowy white skin perfectly. It exuded an innately forbidden allure. His gaze turned deep upon beholding her alluring beauty, which led to something inside stirring. She twisted her body to wrestle free from his grasp when he hissed, Don't move. <laughs> you... Don't move, or I'll do you right here and now. His voice was tight with forbearance and repressed urge. She immediately stood stock still. She did not doubt this man's words. If she really moved, he would make his threat real right on this observation deck. She already had a taste of his tyranny. She was still sulking when she felt something cool lie on her neck. Looking down, her eyes caught sight of an exquisitely sparkling diamond hanging between her clavicles. Is this the pendant he's thrown away earlier? Didn't he just throw it away? Or was he pulling her leg all along? She was stunned momentarily, and at the same time, her lips could not hide a delighted smile. Lowering his head close to her ear, he mouthed, You must wear this pendant at all times. Just as her gaze grew, he barked, You're forbidden from taking it off. His tone, as always, was commanding and incredibly tyrannical. She fingered the necklace, lifted her eyes to look at him, and protested angrily. You are so unreasonable. Yes, I am unreasonable. Standing behind her, he drew her into his embrace slowly with his arms. He watched gaze at the pendant encircling her neck with her almond-shaped eyes, her pink lips spread apart into a faint smile, as her fingertips rubbed against it lovingly. Didn't you say that you dislike it? He could not help teasing her. She snorted. I just find it a pity to throw this away. Stubborn, he chided lightly. This stupid woman was indeed headstrong. The truth was actually the opposite. She really liked his gift. Staring at the lovely dimples lighting her face, he had the strong impulse to lock her lips with his. Egged on by that abrupt impulse, he dipped her in his embrace and lowered his head to kiss her small pinkish lips. Her soft and warm lip flaps only made him want more as he tasted her sweetness. She widened her eyes in shock. His kiss grew more invasive, and she was not the slightest prepared. As she gazed at his broad frame and handsome features, with distinctive contour, she felt his compelling presence magnify before her. Looking at him at such proximity, she realized how long and dense his lashes were, much like two black phoenix tails. It was no wonder his eyes were penetratingly mesmerizing. She must admit that this man was born with God's favor. With his outstanding features, noble disposition, and aristocratic lineage, he was definitely the type to attract a flock of women. She no longer questioned why this man could make many celebrities in the capital swoon, and why even his niece was head over heels for him. This man had everything in his favor, indeed. His thin lips were somewhat cool to the touch. Her mind started to wander. She remembered reading on physiognomy about most people with thin lips being rational and fickle-minded. Is this man fickle-minded? She passively let his kisses dominate her. Bearing down on her eagerly, he burrowed deep into her throat with the wish to swallow her whole if possible. Her thoughts inexplicably started to flutter far as the man hugged her tightly around the waist and affixed his lips onto hers to trace their outline lightly with labored breathing. Did you blacklist my number because Gracia said something to you? She opened her eyes in shock, only to see him staring at her too. 
His look silently questioned her. Why aren't you speaking? Looking doubtful, he caught her chin with his thumb and index fingers. He initially suspected Gracia of making a false claim that she was pregnant with his flesh and blood. Most women were sensitive to this sort of thing. And this was especially the case with the innately stubborn Monica. It would be totally unacceptable to her. This was only a suspicion, though. As for what had really made her blacklist him sans explanation, he would need to clarify that with her. His question inadvertently reminded her of Gracia's pregnancy. That woman had his child, but was that really his? Episode 315 Monica, you've fallen for me. Monica kept silent for a moment. Slowly, she said, She informed me of her carrying her child and accused me of being the third party in your marriage. Huh? Stefan snorted at this. He felt frustrated, but helpless even more so. <sighs> so you believe her? Should the reason for him being blacklisted was other than that, perhaps he could still accept it. But for her to believe the one-sided claim of that insignificant woman, with no substantial evidence, he felt simply dismissed. This woman was too much. Seeing him scoff, she raised a brow. What's wrong? You unconditionally believed her words. So? His deep eyes fixated on her face as he asked, Am I unworthy of your unconditional trust? How am I supposed to trust you? She countered helplessly. She was in no position to question him. The moment she learned of Gracia's pregnancy, she only felt utter despair. She believed it without a doubt then. After all, she was in no position to raise questions, no? That woman was his fiancé, and he was her fiancé. Even if she had his child... It was only right. Was this the time for her to withdraw? She did not think so now. Everything that that woman possessed now was originally hers. She would no longer give in and would use any means possible to take back everything she should rightfully own. With that thought in mind, she pursed her lips. This was when she heard the man's jovial laughter. I know. She frowned. As he scrutinized her uncomfortable look, something came to his mind, and he proceeded to tease her. Did you blacklist me because you were jealous? Her eyes widened in alarm as she saw him gaze on her intently with smudgeness. He observed her stunned look, not with exasperation, but with insufferable arrogance instead. He then recalled Harry's words. Jealousy equaled like. This woman liked him. There was no doubt about it. It was so much so that her feelings for him should be beyond ordinary. Was this why she blacklisted him as she flew into a humiliating rage when Gracia flaunted before her? You like me. He paused. Feeling that this term was inappropriate, he proceeded to change it. Monica, you've fallen for me. His words were curt and casual, yet his tone sounded pleased and overbearing. She stared wide-eyed at him, in her confusion, and wondered where he was getting his confidence. How did jealousy equal like? He actually equated her action with love. Where was this man really getting his confidence from? Don't you want to admit it yet? He laughed as he reached out to tap her delicate nose. This woman must love him deeply for her to be jealous to that extent. According to his subordinate... Women in love would have an extremely incomprehensible possessiveness. They disliked their man being chummy with other women. The more jealous a woman was, the loftier a man's place in her heart. This stupid woman must be madly in love with him. That was probably why she was so jealous. He did not like jealous women all along. Thus, he did not know why this woman was different to him. When he learned of her jealousy... Sparks of joy rose in his heart. Monica, I'm telling you this. 
He turned her around by the shoulder and forced her to look into his eyes as he enunciated, I did not touch her. She was astounded to see him looking at her in such a solemn manner. It was something she had never seen him do before. I've never touched anyone else besides you. Do you believe me? He reiterated, looking somber still. She was confused. Bit by bit, suspicions bloomed in her heart. She was flabbergasted at his explanation. At the bar last time, Gracia arrogantly announced her pregnancy to her. Could it be false? She soon went on to deny it. Impossible. When she bumped into her at the restaurant, she was really having morning sickness. There was no sign of falsehood in that. From her experience, that woman was truly pregnant. At that time she was pregnant with Sam and Andres, she suffered from terrible morning sickness as well. That woman's symptoms were for those over a month pregnant. Now, he was telling her that he did not touch her. Could she believe it? Could this man be trusted? Was that woman faking it? Or was this man lying to her? Her mind was in turmoil. Her face slowly turned cold. She was unable to accept another woman getting pregnant with his child. She was unable to accept his naked lie even more. Hence, she tactfully yet solemnly smiled. Mm. Stefan, you don't need to explain so much. It's obvious that Gracia is pregnant, yet you're denying having touched her now. Pausing, she looked right into his eyes and earnestly asked, Do you treat me as an easily fooled child? Is teasing me fun? Am I really that gullible? He was frustrated. You doubt my words? She paled. Doubt? If you've never touched her, then whose child does hers belong? Don't tell me that she had an affair. She did not believe that Gracia would cheat on him, nor could she believe that the child was not his. If that were the case, it would be a scandalous affair to the Lewis family. With his arrogant attitude, how could he bear such betrayal? His face turned dark upon noticing the undisguised doubt on her face. A hint of sullen anger glinted in his eyes. Monica, don't you have confidence in me? She raised her jaw and expressionlessly answered, I only believe in the truth. He was annoyed. She's pregnant, but the child isn't mine. Then whose? She pressured him, not wanting vague answers. He frowned, kept silent for a while, and coldly asked, Listen, she's merely a pawn I'm using as leverage to gain control of the Lewis family. Right from the very start, I've never touched a single finger of hers. As for who the child belongs to, you'll know it in the future. Pausing, he tightly held her shoulders and solemnly said, You only need to remember that I haven't been intimate with her. That's all. She felt a little fed up and proceeded to push him away. Can you please not talk in riddles with me? She grabbed his lapel in her frustration and questioned him in an uncontrollable manner. If she's a pawn to you, then what about me? Am I a pawn too? Episode 316 You are forbidden from leaving me. Stefan's eyes turned cold and his face contorted with rage. I've never said that you're a pawn. You're willing to be engaged with your so-called pawn, but you can't even give me a legitimate title. Am I not even worth a pawn in your eyes? She laughed coldly. Her retort made his face even darker. He was frozen in that instant. What do you mean? She smiled as she tried to remain calm, but a tremble could still be perceived in her voice. Stefan, I like you. What about you? Do you like me too? His lips parted, but no words came out. The word like was stuck in his throat, unable to be voiced out. He was a proud and arrogant man, so he could not easily utter the word like before the woman he had feelings for. At his silence, the smile on her face slightly cooled. I'll tell you this too. Since I like you, I can acknowledge you and even give you my heart. So, what about you? Can you do the same? He could. 
Although that was what he thought, he could not convey it in words. He stared at her ferociously. For a moment, it was all quiet. Do you know who I just met? With her face slightly pale as her lashes drooped in disappointment, she said weakly, I met Haley Pierce. She righteously accused me before a crowd, ridiculed me for being the third party. Stefan, are my feelings cheap, or in your eyes, am I also merely a pawn for you to exploit and be at your beck and call? You can give Gracie a proper engagement, yet you can't give me a legitimate title. I don't want romantic dates or beautiful diamond pendants, and I don't want you going through all this trouble to please me. She raised her eyes at him with a pale face. Their eyes met. She looked at him, then suddenly closed in on him and pressed herself against his front. She lifted her finger and lightly tapped against his chest. Right there was his powerful heartbeat. I want this. Can you give it to me? He stared at her intently. Her throat felt parched, but she persisted in her questioning. The love I desire. I hope that it will have a legitimate title. Can you give that to me? His continued silence gradually made her feel disheartened. She gave a hollow laugh, and suddenly found this interrogation to be ludicrous. She mentioned his heart. In his heart, was she really a pawn that was there to do his every bidding? Do you know what marriage means to me? If you can't even give me a legitimate title, why should I keep liking you? She gritted her teeth and weakly declared, I don't like you anymore. That one declaration was like an icicle stabbing deeply into his flesh. In that moment, his heart seemed to have been pierced fatally. Did she just refuse to like him? Damn this woman. How could she act on her own? Did he permit her not to like him? He stood rooted to the spot. Along with the stiffening of his massive and proud frame, his facial expression also froze as his eyes showed puzzlement, humiliation, and anger. Unable to accept his continued silence, she turned to leave. He reached out to grab her arm tightly and pulled her back. She felt a wave of dizziness as she was shoved to the front railings. With a hand on her waist and another on the railing, the man trapped her right before him. I'll give you a chance to retract your statement. He lowered his gaze on her and coldly demanded, Retract that statement now. Retract? Her face paled. With her lips curling downward, she retorted, All right. Which statement do you want me to retract? That one about you refusing to like me anymore. The corners of her mouth plummeted further at that. She averted her gaze from him and schooled her face into an impassive and cold look. She remained numb for a long time. Her silence frustrated him endlessly. As his eyes filled with hidden tears, his hand clasping her shoulder inadvertently tightened. Say it! Her vision was never once him. She tried to speak a few times, but her throat was too dry. Say it! He had lost some of his patience. This woman was indeed out to infuriate him. He stared at her cold face while he repeatedly repressed his rage, which was on the verge of exploding. Is it so hard to retract that statement? He glared at her fiercely, then gripped her jaw to make her face him, and carefully enunciated, Monica, keep this in mind. You are forbidden from leaving me. Just what do you mean by that? She snarled. Stefan, you want me to be your kept woman? A canary in your cage? You're my woman, not a canary. He arrogantly corrected her while he kept his gaze on her. You don't need to use those words to put me off. That's right, women. You can have a lot of them. Although her heart was pounding in pain, she fought to maintain a calm face. She nonchalantly added, Just like this. I'm not your only one. You are. How could this woman continue her one-sided conversation? He did not have any other woman but her. With a heavy face, he said, You're my only one. 
She looked at him in shock, yet managed to question him calmly. What can you use to prove it? You want me to give you a legitimate title? It was a rhetorical question, indubitably. She did not speak, but tacitly agreed. The cold wind blew across the observation deck. The evening breeze from the lake was bone-chillingly wet. She backed up against the railings. Despite his control, his grip on her shoulder was still hard enough to elicit a dull pain from her. Her face was unchangingly still. Those black orbs of his focused on her fully. Is a piece of paper so valuable to you? Did this woman trust this paper more than him? She looked up at him in shock. In this man's heart was the marriage certificate a mere piece of paper. He, at her silence, continued, Compared to that piece of paper, am I really unworthy of your trust? She laughed hollowly at that, and then countered, Huh, you can't even give me a piece of paper. So tell me, how can I trust you? This piece of paper was sacred to her, and was worthy of her respect. Alas, something so important to her was deemed by him as worthless. He inclined his head to ask in a deep voice, Your trust seems to be flimsy if it's just reliant on a piece of paper. What can that even guarantee to you? Faded on her. Do you really think that I want this name? Her face was cold. All right. How about we consider each other's position instead? What? Stefan? I love you. She casually declared. All things unchanged? I can't give you a legitimate title. His face froze instantly as his eyes gradually darkened. I'll marry another man. But you must believe. That's just a piece of paper. Even though I live under the same roof as this husband and his wife... And Andre calls him Daddy. You must believe that I'll have nothing to do with him, and that there's only you in my heart. She scoffed, measuring his face as frostiness. She questioned further. Is that all right? Complex emotions continuously swirled within his eyes. He seemed to be trying to repress something. She stared at his handsome face and attempted to find a trace of change in it. How is it? Since you deem that status as unimportant, it surely doesn't matter to you if I do that. Enough. Not enough. That's enough. With a gloomy face, he cut her off. Monica, that is enough. He did not give her a chance to speak more. Grasping her shoulders, he kissed her almost punishingly. He kissed her in a desperate frenzy. The whole world seemed to spin erratically. The kiss was lingering but fear could be traced in it. Her words actually made him feel helpless and afraid. He could not imagine, could not imagine Andres calling another man Daddy. Worst of all, he could not imagine her becoming another man's wife, even if it was only a name. He initially only viewed that as a method to tie two people together, and that it was not binding. In his eyes, it was no better than a negligible contract for fame and profit. Now, he did not think so. The idea of her becoming another man's wife in name was unbearable to him, even for a piece of paper. She stubbornly sealed her lips and refused to give him a chance to enter her mouth. Despite his fierce assault, she did not relent her mouth to him. He went wild at her resistance, his eyes flashing dark red. He wrapped his powerful arms around her waist and forced her body even closer to his chest. Stubbornly, she kept her lips shut until the man tasted a bit of blood. Unconsciously, his lips tore. There was a touch of blood on her lips. His sight fell. The tip of his tongue slowly caressed the bleeding wound, and the metallic taste of blood filled his mouth promptly. Although she was wounded... She refused to give in to him. Just for this metallic taste, he kissed her lips anew. Seemingly losing her soul for a moment, she stared blankly ahead like a lifeless puppet. She resisted his invasive lips 
and gave her a vacant look as she squeezed out these words between teeth. Stefan, do you love me? His body stiffened momentarily as his handsome face froze. She persisted in her questioning. Do you love me? I want to know if you're taking me as your love toy or your lover. Speak! Say something. Is this question difficult for you to answer? Her gaze locked penetratingly on his dark orbs. In the next second, he closed in on her and forcefully sealed her mouth with his again. He plastered her lips with his and looked deeply into her eyes. From his throat, there came a hoarse utterance. Love. Her eyes flashed a second of surprise, and then she stood rooted to the spot. She thought that he would remain silent until the end. Hearing that word come out of his mouth was beyond her wildest imagination. Love. He slowly repeated the word. Licking away with his tongue the bloody stain on her lip flap, he plotted, I'll give you that piece of paper you want. If this was what she wanted, then he would give her just that. She was thoroughly floored. I'll give you the legitimate love you want. She was stunned by his tyrannical declaration. Such a proud man conceding to her in this way was indeed unbelievable. Truthfully, he was an extremely stubborn man. Stubborn and tyrannical. When he set his eyes on something, he would not give up no matter how others tried to dissuade him. In the same way, no other ladies could replace the woman he set his sights on. He could satisfy her every desire, except leaving his side. He would never allow that. He lifted his penetrating gaze and zoomed it on her face warmly and tenderly. His brows had relaxed slightly by now. I can give all you want, except for leaving me. Other than that, I can give you everything. She was dumbstruck. He pressed close to feel her warm, moist lips as clear and distinct words tumbled from his. You want my entire being, so I'll give to you only. I promise you, I won't touch any other woman. You are the only one. I only want you. Can she understand? His confession seemed rather awkward. There was none of those flowery languages or everlasting vows like other men. His every word was so blunt and insistent. In a serious tone, he told all that to her, without preamble. Monica, I only want you. Stefan! If you like, I can give you my whole world. In fact, he would give her that, sans a reservation. Except for leaving me, I can give you everything. Now, can I kiss you? He asked in his hoarse voice. He wanted her. He really wanted her like crazy. This woman was like a spell cast on him. Now, he was entrapped with no way out, except through her. She sipped her lips as her heart received a thorough shock via his confession. Slowly... She extended her jade-like arms across his waist. It was like an invitation to him. She felt his slender fingertips gently raise her chin up. His perfect face inched closer intimately. Lowering his head, he gently covered her mouth with his thin, moist lips. His fresh breath lingered between his teeth. The refreshing aroma that was uniquely his surrounded and mesmerized her. Episode 318, Ultimate Leader Monica frowned in disbelief, her eyes widening to show her shock. Stefan looked at her and then covered her eyes with his palm before he lightly closed his. The soft and tender kiss reverberated through her very being and made her heart pound fast and furious. The soft moonlight gently spilled from the star-mottled sky. Under the pristine white moonlight, 
His face was embellished in a ghastly glow that complemented his jade-like skin. She opened her eyes and peered through the gap between his fingers. His impeccable profile took her breath away. Stefan imprisoned her in his embrace, with a hand lifting her chin and another caressing the fray hair gently framing her face, his lips locked down onto hers. Unlike his earlier aggressive stance, it was now filled with never-before-seen loving tenderness. He suckled softly and intimately around her lips. No woman could possibly resist this tenderness that might even melt ice. Her ears turned red from his kiss, and a faint blush rose steadily on her cheeks. Her two hands started flapping on his chest uneasily. He grabbed her wrists and slowly moved them toward his waist. Following his lead, she found herself interlacing her fingers around his waist. Her knuckles had turned white at this point from nervousness. Suddenly, fireworks exploded way above them and spread its radiance across in the vast night sky. He raised his eyes slightly as his slender long fingers stroked her face lightly. His fingertips caressed her skin, which was smooth like silk. The touch electrified him and made his heart jump. Somewhere inside him seemed to reach a tipping point. He kissed her between her brows, which delighted him with their beautiful arches. He kissed her almond-shaped eyes, which captivated his heart. He kissed the tip of her nose, which was so exquisite and delicate in his eyes. Finally, he kissed her lip flaps. This was what he loved the most. A bite of the apple made him yearn for more. His broad and tall frame pressed on her without reservation. She started to feel the strain of his weight on her. Uh, Stefan! Huh? He seemed oblivious to her skittish pleats. Stefan! She cried out coyly again. What? Not here, please! She negotiated with him. He neutrally cut her off. Yes, here. The observation deck came with the most beautiful night view and happened to be one of the most secluded and elegant spots on the island. This also meant that there would be no interference from anyone. Her cheeks flushed red as she said, I'm hungry. I'm hungry too. His hushed, magnetic voice sounded hoarse and repressed. His quick breathing almost scorched her cheeks with its heat, which caused her to blush even more. Stop teasing me, all right? Ah, uh, I'm not teasing you. I am really hungry. I'm really hungry, too. She kept quiet, sulking. This man can be too much. Are you a kid? Why are you so childish? Since you know that I'm childish, why can't you give in to me? Oh, you. She was antagonized into speechlessness. Leaning over, he kissed her lovely earlobe and hissed. I'll feed you first, and then you feed me next. Deal? It was a compromise for him. He listed his terms and conditions out in the open. His low and dry tone, together with the deep and penetrating look on her, barely concealed his suppressed urge. Looking at the desire burning in his eyes, nothing seemed capable of extinguishing the flames. She was moved, and licked her lips in anticipation but she was indeed famished this time. Her tummy was rumbling by now. Back in the Crystal Estate, she had locked herself in the room to make up for her lost sleep. That meant that she had not eaten anything since this morning. I want to eat first, she told him clearly. He carried her in his arms in the next second. Her world swirled for a moment as her feet left the ground. Before long, she was buoyed into the dining table by him. She tried getting off him, but he resisted. With his strong and long arms hugging her waist, he firmly embraced her on his lap. His chest was sturdy and warm, and it was broad enough to accommodate her entire being. She bit her lower lip as her whole being was embraced entirely by him, close to his chest. Her two legs draped loosely on his legs. He carried her now, as if he were holding a child. Through the thin fabric of his shirt, she could feel the strong thumping of his heart. 
Her face instantly blushed crimson. She renewed her struggle to break free from his embrace. His low, magnetic voice rang above her head just in time. Don't move, or I'll let you feed me now. He had suppressed his urge to the best of his aptitude. Knowing how hungry she was, he was doing his best to hold back. If she were so much as to move, his bulwark might just disintegrate with a rousing consequence. He pressed the silver-colored service bell on the table, and the flavorful dishes were quickly served one by one thereafter. The table was just the right size to hold the 18-course delectable meal. The ambrosial food assaulted their senses. They were wholly immersed in this astounding sea of appetizing aroma. French pigeon meat pine tart, black truffle tomato tartare with fresh oysters, orange foie gras sauce, every menu item laid on the table was the ultimate leading European cuisine, enticing enough to hook anyone's appetite. She stared with dumbfounded eyes at all these presented dishes. Every menu item was exquisite, like a piece of expensive art. They looked so lovely that she felt reluctant to use her utensils on them for fear of spoiling the beautiful sight. However, her tummy was calling out to her relentlessly. The saliva secreted inside her oral cavity was especially active. She swallowed a mouthful, an obvious sign of her extreme hunger. He smiled slightly as his palm stroked her growling tummy. She looked really hungry. Hence, with one hand on her waist, he picked up a fork with another. What do you want to eat? She quickly quipped in embarrassment. I'll feed myself. Let me feed you. Not necessary. I'll do it myself. She insisted. He pinched her face and kindly reminded her. We have an agreement that I'll feed you first. Retain your strength for later, when you're the one feeding me. Her cheeks burned with his words. <laughs> you don't have to. He reiterated slowly, I'll feed you. His tone told her that his words were not dismissible. In the end, she gave up and let him cater to her. He picked up a piece of steak, cut into bite size, and slowly brought it next to her mouth. She bit into it easily. The delicious, juicy gravy oozing from the tender meat overfilled her mouth. It was soft, yet firm with a great texture. Is it delicious? Delicious. It was so tasty, she almost did not bother replying. Her eyes laid squarely on the table full of delights, while her face expressed an ultimate contentment. He was not into French cuisine, though. After all, no matter how tasty something could be, one could get tired of it once eaten too often. Episode 319. It is your turn to feed me. Exquisiteness was particular in French cuisine. Stefan was able to tell the difference in taste at once. Different chefs had their individual understanding of food. Therefore, the same dish under different hands could naturally acquire a different flavor. Undoubtedly, unlike her, he had higher expectations of the food's taste. He was extremely picky. However, no matter how he specially selected what he thought was tasty and passed it to her mouth, it would degenerate once it was her turn to sample the food. Delicious. It was as delicious as Andre's cooking. Still, when it came to the food's taste, her son's cooking was way better. Although French cuisine was exquisite and delicious, it was not catered to personal preferences. Andres knew her preferences best. After a period of experimentation, the little guy completely had his mommy's food preferences down pat. Hence, every meal was prepared to suit her fancy. She inevitably muttered as a corollary of that, It's delicious, but it's only passable if compared to Andres' cooking. My son can cook. Stefan cocked a brow, clearly surprised. Well, yes. Upon giving this answer, she cast him a wary glance. Don't think about it. Andres only cooks for me. He's my personal chef. 
Monica had a little smug look on her face. Stefan could not help pinching her cheek. Well, it felt nice to the touch. She dodged his move and rubbed her belly. I'm still hungry. Feed me again. He broke into laughter at that. Scanning the table, he sided fresh oyster and scooped it up with a spoon. The tender flesh of the oyster was mouth-watering. She waited excitedly. Alas, the man selfishly fed himself that mouthful of the oyster. She was stunned into freezing stiffly for a moment. There was only one fresh oyster, yet it was in his mouth now. He had agreed to feed her, no? You! What have you done? She exasperatedly accused the man of foul play with her eyes. How did the food that he had agreed to feed her end up in his mouth instead? With the fresh oyster between his lips, he was in no hurry to swallow it. He lightly gazed at her in a silent provocation. She was unwilling to back down, of course. Holding his face, she leaned over and mounted an attack on his mouth to snatch that delicacy. With her lips affixed to the corner of his, she bit and successfully snatched that fresh oyster into her mouth. Delicious. Gorgeous. It was truly a feast for the eyes. No matter what beautiful people did, it was all easy on the eyes. That was the case with Monica. Seizing the opportunity, he kissed her ravenously. His tongue flicked across the sauce on her lips as he deepened the kiss even more. It was probably mutual for the both of them. This was one of the most intimate interactions of mankind. Nonchalant and unbridled, he relished the taste of her lips. She was so startled by his surprise assault that she leaned backward. He did not let her hide from him, though and tightly held her nape to press her body against his. He was not hungry at first. However, looking at her, he felt a little hungry too. The tip of his tongue gently swept clean every part of her seductive lips. Nothing was missed out. He seemed to be seriously sampling a delicacy. In this way, he continued feeding her food mouth to mouth. She felt a little uncomfortable at first totally unused to such an intimate feeding method, so she reached out to take the knife from his hand and do it herself. His hand, however, evaded hers. He fancied this method of feeding and found it to be very enjoyable. Somehow, the dull and bland meal tasted unbelievably delicious in her mouth. The man was a clean freak. Stefan usually hated skin contact with anyone, be it kissing or touching. Stefan was utterly repulsed by any form of contact with another. In contrast, he was thirsty for such intimacy with this woman. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth feeding was originally the most primitive method of feeding. Newborn babies did not have motor skills, so mothers would feed them food through such a way. However, now, most couples found such a method difficult to adapt. That piece of oyster was lost in his mouth earlier but this woman very naturally snatched it from him, sans the slightest repulsion in her eyes. This form of intimacy made him feel a warm fuzziness in the depths of his heart. He seemed to have a penchant for intimacy with this woman. He had never felt such a desire before. In that moment, something that was long frozen seemed to have been thawed. He could not help but desire more of such intimacy. Thus, when she reached out to snatch the cutlery from him, he shunned her hand. How could he let her interrupt his pleasure? She glared at him in annoyance and solemnly announced, I can do it on my own. I don't need you to feed me. I'll feed you. No, I'll do it on my own. I'll feed you. Hello? I will feed you. She frowned in exasperation. How is this man so hateful? He even took away her freedom to eat. He, for his part, found her pouty look unexpectedly cute. He loved seeing such expressions on her. Not eating? He asked that when she went stiff in his embrace. She was feeling piqued and wanted to pay heed to him no more. She was petulant and sulky at the same time. The man bowed his head slightly and asked, are you full? 
She stubbornly pursed her lips with a little show of indifference toward him. Since you're full, it's your turn to feed me. With that said, his warm hand slowly reached out for the silky smooth skin under her skirt in search of her mysterious zone. She hurried to stop his exploration in shock and asked with exasperation, What are you doing? Eating you. <laughs> you... Just what goes in your head all day? She felt vexed at his ludicrous behavior. It's of how to eat you up. She was left momentarily speechless by that, and only answered a while later with a dark face. I haven't had enough yet. A damn good-looking brow of his lifted as he sucked on a piece of steak in his mouth and leaned closer to her face. She was past caring this time around. She was simply too hungry. Once a man grew hungry, he would not care for other obligations, so she simply held onto his shoulders and swallowed the food from his mouth. He, therefore, continued to feed her in such a cumbersome way repeatedly. Gradually, she got used to him feeding her in this way. Just like an obedient kitten, she nestled in the man's embrace and accepted the food from his mouth without fear. One after another, Half of the delicacies on the table quickly disappeared in their mouths. After feeding her the foie gras using his mouth, he seized the opportunity to kiss her again. This kiss got out of hand, though. Episode 320 Her Request Sitting here on his body, Stefan deepened the kiss. Monica still had some rationality left in her. Consciously realizing that they were in a restaurant's private room, and not knowing who might enter at any given time, she inevitably felt a tad nervous. Don't do it here. Someone is bound to enter later. That won't happen. He reassured her with his lips. This place was under his rule. Hence, without his permission, who would dare to step in here? Her worries were thus entirely superfluous. Unable to resist him further, she could only succumb to his intense kisses. She must admit, though, that this man's initial kissing technique was rudimentary. When he had first kissed her, he had clumsily seized it by force. Now his kissing skills were superb and polished, and he made that clear to Monica. Monica was not at all his match. One lingering kiss and she melted into his embrace. He did not even move to the next step yet. Kissing alone had already caused her to feel a spine-tingling sensation. Her emotions emerged abruptly. Her shoulders trembled slightly as she shrank inwardly. She could not help reaching out to fend off his advances. He took advantage of the situation to land light pecks on her jade-like fingertips. Numbness spread from her fingertips to her heart. His long, slender fingers then lifted her chin. With half-hooded lids, he kissed her lips and tossed them around. He proceeded to support her body by hugging her waist, and this elicited an exclamation from her. As he came back to reality, he noticed the ambiguous position of her body tightly pressing against his. The ambiguity was inexplicable. The temperature in the room suddenly heated up. He lightly pecked her lips and whispered to her ear, Monica, be with me. His clear and hypnotizing voice held a tinge of unprecedented indulgence. He voiced out his wish for her to be with him and to give him the whole world, his whole world. Her face warmed at his request. Slowly, she nodded with a low, Huh? Yes, let them be together. She would give him the whole world too. Her whole world. There was also a bedroom in the private room. Washroom, bed, sofa. The room was fully equipped, just like a dream apartment. He hugged her to the sofa and carefully laid her on it. As if she were an extremely fragile treasure, his movement was so gently, she seemed to be dreaming. She had never been so tenderly loved by a man before. Could she perhaps be dreaming all this? 
As she worried needlessly, her heart trembled in fear. She feared that everything here was all but a dream. When the dream fell apart, she would awake to reality. She was confused. Unable to restrain her emotions, she reached out to caress his handsome face. Long, slender fingers caressed every inch of his godly features. It felt incredibly real. This was not a dream, then. Her fingertips trembled at the thought. He grasped her hands and planted kisses on them, interlocking their fingers, his body slowly laid on top of hers. He entered her in this position. There was neither a harsh assault nor extortion. His movements were much gentler than before. He cherished her. He could not bear to hurt her. He wanted to make it clear to her that being with him was a wonderful affair. In the aftermath, she gently closed her eyes and lay in his embrace. With his warm chest as her pillow, her fingers played with the necklace on her collarbone. The diamond embedded in the pendant was carved into the shape of an exquisite shooting star. Exquisite, noble, elegant. It was simply mesmerizing. It was so beautiful. The pupils in her phoenix eyes shone brightly and seemed to contain laughter. Apparently, she dearly loved this pendant and could not bear to part with it. Her eyes did not hide her fondness for the pendant. Seeing her fondness for his gift placed him in a festive mood. Harry's eyes were not that bad after all. He placed a hand around her body and bowed his head to kiss her brow gently. She gave him a shy smile as her fear faced blushed profusely. It was clear that she felt bashful, the dimples on her cheeks showcasing her silly innocence. Her dimples were cute and made her smile look sweet. Unable to help himself, he landed a peck on each of her dimples. He was infatuated with them, and even more so, loved this innocent look of hers. Beautiful and alluring. Charming and enchanting. It was obvious how innocent and pure she looked, but from within, just like a charm, she exuded a woman's most primitive allure. He suspected that this woman had wreaked havoc in her past life. In ancient times, she was probably a coquettish concubine of an enamored emperor. Looking at this silly innocence of hers, his Adam's apple bobbed as his lower abdomen tensed up anew. He just could not have enough of her. This woman had no idea that the man beside her was feeling hot and bothered all over again. She also did not know that he loved her so much he fought hard to suppress his desires. She looked up abruptly and smiled with her eyes. After some deliberation, she carefully opened up. Stefan, I want to ask you a question. Stefan, he suddenly voiced out a word which made her confused. She did not exactly quite understand what he meant by that word. Looking at her clueless face, he raised his hand to stroke her nose and laughed. Little fool, you don't need to call my name. His words clarified to her his intention. Blushing, she tested it out. Uh, Steph? Her voice was light and soft. She uttered only one word, yet his entire being nearly melted. It was a simple syllable, yet completely lethal. An electric current seemed to spread all over his body. Her calling him by this nickname implied that she was his most intimate person. She was the first. Her voice was soft, crisp, and immensely enjoyable. He liked how she called him that. Hence, he lightly planted a kiss on her lips and requested, Repeat it. She closed her mouth, obviously feeling a little shy. Repeat it. Uh, Steph? Make your voice softer a little. Steph. He was satisfied and rewarded her with a kiss on the lips again. The tip of his tongue wandered around the shape of her lips. She protested coquettishly by pushing him away. Hey, why are you doing this? Why not? I have a question to ask you. We can talk later. 
he had no intention to care for other things. He only wanted to indulge in her beauty and tenderness until he was satisfied. She saw how he was acting unrestrained again and reached out to block his lips. Can I see Sam in the future? She mumbled, nerves and pleas written clearly on her face. She was very fond of the boy. At the same time, she was very sorry for him. The last time she saw the child was at the amusement park. Despite the mother-son pair being apart for seven years and only meeting once, she felt very close to him. I hope you enjoyed the episodes. Thank you for listening. See you on the next episodes. Please don't forget to share, like, and subscribe.